Montgomery, go at throttle up. Hello? Hello? How's everybody doing? Okay. A lot has happened today. Yeah. Did you ban the robot? Alright. No, no. How are you doing? I'd be lying to you if I said I was all right, but it's okay. There's a point at which doing carbon everything is beyond the price performance worth point. At that point, you are better giving a driver X lax and pointing to the porta potty. Thoughts on countering opinion? Wait, what? I'm I don't know the topic. What are we talking about? Drummer being a good mod for once, drummer. Shoot that guy. Shoot that guy. <clears throat> Ready to deal with chat? It's not just chat, dead crew. Uh, you made a typo, serious. We don't need to time you out now. Because you look silly. Porsche GT4 RS being twice the cost of the GT4. Saving a few grams for a car for tens of thousands. That ten, if that tens of thousands makes your fastest car around the Nürburgring, then it's a big difference. <laughs> Will the recent incre increase in 7% risk of space to re-puncturing the spacesuit remain that high consistently or fluctuate at certain spots in the orbit? Consistent. It's consistent. Because they there's untracked debris. Everything okay? Um, <clears throat> hanging the second stage on neutron is very interesting. Atlas does that. We were talking about that two days ago, team man. Atlas five, the forward load reactor. What do you think that does? It hangs Centaur because it can't take the loads. Yeah, but you could save a couple kilos with X lax. James May won't like that comment. You know what the messed up part about that is, Thomas? I agree with James May. Not every car needs to be a goddamn Euro Touring sedan. That's really annoying. It killed cars that are actually comfortable and nice to ride around in. You lot killed the freaking American car. With your M3s and your E63 AMGs. I agree with James wholeheartedly. There's a reason why during lockdown, James got the, uh, the Cadillac and he liked it. You know why? Because it's a nice ride. Can't, I'm telling you, dudes, you can't mess with a caddy's ride. Did you get decent sleep? No. Not really. Or have the driver hit the gym. <laughs> Scary. I'm going to default to your judgment on this one. American cars. Oh, those cars are not like the cars that I have, so I'm going to put cars in parentheses to talk down to you. Yeah, typical Englishman. Look. Look, at the end of the day, you guys can't stunt on a car that looks and rides like this. This thing's like floating on a cloud, man. I'm telling you. Caddy put all of their engineering into ride comfort, baby. It's the only GM product I'd get. That and a Corvette. Imagine still worshipping monarchs. I can see chat's back to normal. That's good. 
Sure you can. Rolls Royce. I'm taking a caddy. Thank you very much. That does not stop on a dime. Yeah, but you when you when you crash, you'll be really comfortable right up until the point when you crash. Ah, oh, that's awesome, Dish. My first render of Starship Super Savvy on the on the pad. You say that when the DS exists. Well, the DS, well, the DS suffers from the same fate, Alex. This damn touring car, freaking every freaking car is a oh, touring car. Nurburgring tested. That's dumb. You're going through whatever you crash into, though. See, Mutter, you get it. They really are nice, Thomas. They're beautiful cars. Lewis Hamilton, McLaren F1T. We have all the best stuff here. Yeah, we have freedom, though. <sighs> Smell that? Smells like oil. Freedom. I went through a Lexus with a Ford once. It wasn't pretty nice. I want to yeet an Eldorado around the ring one day. Scary, if we take that Cadillac 500 that's in there, wake it up a little bit and give it disc brakes, I guarantee you it'll be the smoothest ride around the ring you've ever you've ever experienced. But, man, all I'm thinking is understeer. <laughs> understeer for days. But on the straights, though, the thing, the thing will get up and go. Lewis Hamilton is poo. <laughs> I want it laying lay in frame in the carousel. We gotta orchestrate this and we gotta stream it somehow, dude. Hey, Nazalik, how are you? Anyway, a 70s Rolls Royce is faster over 23 miles of rough terrain than an F-150. What? There was no F-150 in the 70s, Tessa. Chickadee, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Okay. I don't know, Solarlander, maybe. PCB is ready for assembly. At dawn we build. Nice. Excited for the new Grand Tour? Absolutely. <laughs> Carnage et toi. <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. I love it. We want some onboard from Jetta. Let me see. I don't hate this noise. Oh look, along straight into a hairpin. Nice. Is this a track or is this the pit lane? What the hell? Is this a track or is this the pit lane? Look at how narrow this is. Hold on. Discovery. See it get squirrely? That's the that's all that moment, Alex from the from the freaking motor. That's front engine. Front engine cars do that, dude. That, someone's, yeah, someone's gonna crash. It'll be like Karen Chendhawk in Singapore, where he tries to drive the corner and didn't enter right, and the car just goes straight into a wall. You guys remember that? Oh no, the car is broken! I've crashed! Oh, I, I'm in the street! Help! <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> Kinda tried to turn, and then something on the car just didn't, and the thing went straight. <laughs> it went right into a wall. Here, okay. Anyway, drummer, put another bookmark in. Let's get to space news. There's a, uh, at the top of the hour, there's a NASA press conference about commercial stations. NASA started handing out contracts for commercial low or orbit destinations. Uh, so that's cool. Um, for which, free flying, oh, commercially owned and on. operated destinations in low Earth orbit. That will advance NASA's goal. There, hold on. That will advance NASA's goal for continuous presence in low Earth orbit by transitioning from the International Space Station to a commercial model. And this will also serve as part of the foundation of That's the robust and a lot of front US led bias. commercial yeah. economy in low Earth orbit. Yeah, I'll scare you. I'll default to your will host a panel of representatives from NASA and the awarded companies to provide comments and answer questions from the media. Joining our panel today is 
Phil McAllister, the Director of Commercial Space Flight at Devin NASA headquarters in Washington. Angela Hart, the Manager of NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Yeah, Baxi, that's a little strange. Brent Sherwood, Senior Vice President of Advanced Development Program at Blue Origin. And Dr. Janet Cavandi, former NASA astronaut and Sierra Space President. Jeffrey Manberg. President of International and Space Stations for Voyager Space and Chairman of the Board at NanoRack. I saw it, Lynn Prod. It looks and good. And Rick Mastracchio, Director oh, of Business astronaut. Development for Human Exploration at Northrop Grumman. We'll first start with some opening comments from... Now, hold on one second, guys. I, I wanted to show you this to start Space News. If you've seen Rocket Lab, Rocket Lab had an update no, from the Neutron Rocket. Hey, JT, 57 month reset. Can we award it to Spin Launch? This is for... Space stations, Theo. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, you could. Um, so if you guys haven't seen Rocket Lab's new rocket, actually, they were nice enough to send me over a model. I have a model of, of the Neutron rocket, and they actually, it just came in a second ago. Um, here, take a look. There you go. It's the same picture. All right, sorry. I needed to make that joke. All right, cool, let's go. Each of our briefers before taking questions. Questions will come in on our phone bridge as well as social sorry, media platforms. <laughs> if you're on the phone, please press star one to add your I mean, name to our queue and ask a question. If you're on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. Nice. Is the first one me? We'll now begin with initial remarks from Phil McAllister. Thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to all the members of the media participating in today's teleconference and everyone else who's listening and following these new developments in commercial spaceflight. Um, welcome. Uh, the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destination Awards NASA is announcing today mark an exciting new chapter in the development of the LEO economy. These awards will help ensure the United States has a continuous human presence in LEO as required by the U.S. National Space Policy and the NASA Transition Authorization Act yeah. of 2017. And they will also help ensure our astronauts will continue to have access to the LEO environment to do critical science and microgravity and advanced human, human space exploration after the retirement of the International Space Station. With your own spacecraft, <laughs> right? NASA was very pleased to have received 11 proposals map, right? to our announcement, which was a tremendous number. Uh, almost all of the proposals represented viable concepts for commercial LEO destinations. While we selected the best companies based on our evaluation criteria, we encouraged the non-selected companies to continue to develop their concepts. The next chapter in our commercial LEO efforts is planned to be a full and open competition in the mid part of this decade for certification of the systems and for NASA's purchase of destination services. That procurement is likely to represent a very, very sizable financial commitment on the part of NASA. <clears throat> so uh, the envelope, please. Uh, this is not very dramatic because I'm sure you guys have already read the award announcement, uh, but the awardees of NASA's Commercial Leo Destination Agreements are in alphabetical order. Blue Origin of Kent, Washington, along with Sierra Space for their orbital reef destination in the amount of $130 million. NanoRacks of Houston, Texas for their Star Lab destination in collaboration with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin in the amount of $160 million. And Northrop Grumman Systems of Dulles, Virginia for their Commercial Leo Destinations concept in the amount of $125.6 million. <clears throat> so congratulations, Blue Origin, NanoRacks, and Northrop Grumman, and all of their partners. I also want to congratulate and sincerely thank each NASA employee who contributed to the evaluation. These individuals completed a tremendous amount of work in a relatively short period of time, and they did a really excellent job and joke. made my, my uh, decision uh -huh. a lot easier by all the work that they put in. So thank you. <clears throat> So each company will give you more details about their specific concepts in a moment, but I just wanted to say a few words about the overall the portfolio uh, that we now have. <clears throat> there it is. 
First, we have a very diverse group of companies in terms of age, size, and business strategy. I think this diversity will make NASA's strategy for commercial destinations very robust, and it will ensure a healthy competition in the days ahead for safe, reliable, and cost-effective commercial LEO destinations. Second, we have a diverse set of technical concepts, including inflatable modules, metallic structures, and a combination of inflatable and metallics. There are a variety of launch vehicles and logistics systems planned by the companies, leveraging NASA's prior investments in crew and cargo transportation. This diversity not only enhances the likelihood of success of NASA's strategy, but it also leads to a high degree of innovation, which is critical in most commercial space endeavors. So I talked a little bit about the diversity, but there's some aspects that were consistent among the proposals. All three companies proposed testing or hardware demonstrations as part of their agreements. I'm a strong believer in tests. Uh, design reviews are important as they allow the NASA team to understand the system design and operation, but actual hardware testing where you can observe how the hardware perform, performs is a clear measure of progress and quality. And the testing buys down risk. So I was very pleased to see uh, each one of these companies including that in their agreements. Also, all the companies proposed an initial operating capability of their systems prior to 2030. If the International Space Station is extended to 2030, this will provide some schedule margin for the overall system development and ensure that we don't have a gap in our access to low Earth um, or orbit. Finally, NASA encouraged bidders to maximize their financial contribution to these activities. The combined percentage of non-NASA investment is over 60%, with NASA's contribution under 40%. Clearly, these companies believe in the LEO economy and the non-government market for destination services. NASA believes in this as well, which should make for strong partnerships going forward. I should also point out that we should keep in mind that NASA is also funding Axiom Space's concept for a commercial LEO destination. We awarded that contract to Axiom last year with a maximum contract value of $140 million. Axiom's strategy is to initially attach multiple modules to the International Space Station and then detach to operate as a free-flying platform. And the company is very busy maturing its concept and completing its contractual milestones. Uh, the concepts that we are awarding today are all planned to go directly to orbit as free-flying destinations. Um, so to sort of clarify what we're calling all these things, um, the Axiom contract is called the Commercial Destination ISS, or CDISS. And the awards today are called Commercial Destination Free Flyer, or CDFF. All four are part of NASA's Commercial LEO Destinations effort. Taken together, these four companies provide a solid footing for NASA's strategy. I am very confident that one or more of these concepts will be successful and we'll eventually be providing commercial LEO destination services to NASA and to other customers for many years to come. Thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> okay. Great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks for those opening remarks. And now we will pass it over to Angela Hart, manager of this program. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for being here today. Today is another critical step as NASA continues to support the development of a robust and sustainable commercial LEO economy. The awards today represent NASA's investment and enabling of these commercial no. free-flying destinations or commercial orbiting stations that will allow NASA to meet our needs as an agency and I ensure a seamless transition there. of activities from the International Space Station. As noted in the past, we estimate that our agency's future needs in low Earth orbit will require accommodations and training for there at least go. two CREM members Thank continuously, you. and the ability to perform approximately 200 investigations annually to support human research, no, technology right demonstrations, one. biological and physical science, and a national lab, and, and all the national lab needs. We have a two-phase strategy that builds on the successful legacy of our commercial cargo and commercial crew programs that now are de delivering important research supplies and astronauts to the International Space Station. This strategy will provide services the government needs at a lower cost, enable the agency to focus on its Artemis missions to the moon and onto Mars, while continuing to use low Earth orbit as a training and proving ground for our deep space missions. 
In the first phase, it still stated we are pursuing multiple funded space act agreements for early concept development of commercial destinations. Phase one will take us into 2025 timeframe. And in the second phase, NASA intends to certify commercial LEO destinations and purchase destination services via FAR based acquisition contract when services become available prior to the retirement of the space station. The goal of my office is to implement this two-phase strategy and ensure that we work closely with the companies during their formulation and design phases in preparation for awarding services to at least one commercial station capable of providing NASA, yeah, our international partners, and other U.S. government agencies a platform to continue our presence and work in low Earth orbit. In parallel to the Phase One Space Act agreements and the Axiom contract, we will be finalizing our safety certification and service requirements for NASA crew visitation to a commercial destination that will need to be met by bit. proposers as part of the services contract phase. Phase two is targeted to begin in 2026, allowing time for human rating and certification process with the goal to have no gap in the U.S. continuous presence in space that we've, now, that we've had now for more than 21 years. We plan to release our draft service and crew requirements next year. This strategy allows NASA to develop requirements for commercial low Earth orbit destinations in parallel with our commercial partners' development. As we jointly work and learn with these new partners and continue to work with Axiom Space, we will ensure a safe but innovative solution for new platforms in LEO. Again, we are extremely excited to make these awards today to the Orbital Reef team led by Blue Origin, with Sierra Space, to Nanorax in collaboration with Voyager Space and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. My team is ready and we look forward to working with each of these companies and their teams closely over the coming years. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. Cool. Beam update. Thank you, Angela. Okay, so now let's hear from the companies. First, we will have the Orbital Reef team with Brent Sherwood, Senior Vice President of Advanced Development Programs at Blue Origin and Dr. Janet Cavandi uh, at Sierra Space. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Today's a great day for the agency and for competitive commercial space business. Uh, Blue Origin and Sierra Space have partnered to develop Orbital Reef, a uh, commercially owned and operated low Earth orbit space station. Our teammates are on the line with us today, Boeing, Redwire Space, Genesis Engineering Solutions, and Arizona State University. Our whole team's grateful for NASA's contributions to the design of Orbital Reef and its revolutionary approach to making Earth orbit accessible to more diverse customers and industries. Orbital Reef is a mixed-use space business park that will offer reduced cost and complexity, turnkey services, and inspiring space architecture to support any business. In addition to meeting the International Space Station partners' needs, will develop new commercial markets that stimulate a growing space economy even before the West's only space station is decommissioned. Shared infrastructure allows us to efficiently support the diverse and proprietary needs of users, tenants, and visitors, research, industrial, and personal, government, commercial, and global. Accommodations, vehicle docking ports, and utilities all scale as market demand grows. Our human-centered space architecture with big volumes, big hatches, big windows, world-class amenities, Better advanced robotics, and the single-person spacecraft is inspiring, practical, and safe. Reusable space transportation Papa and Jeff's. smart design, accompanied by advanced automation and logistics, will minimize cost and complexity for both traditional space operators and new arrivals, allowing the widest range of users to pursue their goals. Orbital Reef will reach baseline configuration, which you see in the NASA press release, in the second half of this decade. With that, I'll introduce Janet Cavandi, president of Sierra Space. Thank you, Brent. Sierra Space is very honored to be selected alongside our partner, Blue Origin, and all of our talented and experienced team members. We plan to combine the best that we each bring to create a truly unique and creative approach to the next generation space station. Sierra Space will provide a large integrated flexible environment or life to orbital reef. This large module will provide ample habitable volume, saving significant launch costs in creating 
on-orbit living and working spaces. We will also provide transportation for both crew and cargo to the orbital reef by the use of our Dream Chaser space plane. We intend to continue NASA's relationships with international partners and offer opportunities for existing and future countries to participate in orbital reef. Due to the flexibility of a, space, of a space plane, we can also bring crew and cargo back to commercial runways worldwide. Space. We are also able to offer research cap capabilities and safe transportation back to Earth for delicate payloads and research that has been on the hiatus since More the like shuttle program plane. ended a decade ago. Mr. Neeraj Gupta, General Manager for Space Destinations, will lead our orbital reef efforts at Sierra Space. On behalf of CEO Tom Weiss, our owners Aaron and Fadi Osman, and all of our new investor partners, thank you for this opportunity to share with you our collective vision and future in low Earth orbit. Great, thank you both. Sounds exciting. Okay, now on to really? Jeffrey Ranver, President of International and Space Stations for Voyager Space and Chairman of the Board at NanoRack. Hey, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of everyone at Nanorax, uh, Voyager Space, Lockheed, and our team. Uh, we want to thank everyone at NASA and Congress and the administration uh, for believing in this new era of commercial, privately owned space stations. Uh, this is something that we know is critical for American leadership. Uh, and it's a, a also critical to make sure there is no space station gap as we retire the International Space Station. Uh, so it's an extremely important day for the community, for the industry, and for the nation. Uh, also joining me on the call is uh, Kirk Scheiman, uh, the Vice President of Lunar Exploration and former uh, head of the uh, space station program from Lockheed, uh, if, the, if you guys in the press have any technical uh, questions. Um, so, uh, drum roll, please. Let me tell you about the Star Lab. Uh, it's, uh, the core is inflatable. As Phil mentioned, uh, we're one of the teams putting in an um, inflatable uh, module habitat, plus it has a metallic node plus the uh, bus. What's really, really important to us is that the payload capac uh, capability is equivalent to the ISS at 22 uh, meters cubed. Uh, we're looking at a 2027 uh, launch, yep. and what is also really exciting to me was important to us as a team, uh, we're looking at reaching uh, initial full capacity in one launch. Um, it's continuously crewed by four astronauts, uh, and the uh, core of the concept of Star Lab is to be as sustainable a business model as possible. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we were very proud uh, previously to introduce the George Washington Carver Science Park, uh, which is the world's first ever science park. It's currently operating on the International Space Station, and it will be transitioning uh, onto the uh, Star Lab. And that's an important point that I do want to raise. Uh, NASA has been very clear. Congress has been very clear that they want a sustainable, as sustainable a business model. Uh, as possible. And with Nanorax, we bring two decades of understanding and leading and utilization in low Earth orbit and on the International Space Station. And, um, and, and you know, that is something that's extremely important to me uh, and also making sure we have continuity uh, with our current ISS partners and we have a seamless transition from the ISS into the new era of private uh, space stations. Uh, one, one final comment, uh, if I may, um, we don't see coming out of this one winner. Uh, what we see coming out of this is at the end of this decade, there will be multiple uh, privately owned space stations. Maybe they're in differing orbits, uh, which would certainly strengthen the ecosystem and strengthen the space transportation system. Maybe there will be multiple platforms focused on different market niches. And so this is really the beginning of what's a game changer. We've had a decade of uh, the United States government and industry focused on space transportation, and now we're entering a new era of uh, destinations, and we could not, all of us, at Nanorats, Voyager, Lockheed, and the whole Star Lab team be more excited. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you.
Thank you very much Excellent. there, Guy. Thank you so much. We appreciate and you talking today. And next we'll hear from Rick Mastracchio, who is also a former NASA astronaut and Director of Business Development for Human Exploration at Northrop Grumman. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, first, let me say congratulations to the NanoRex and the Blue Origin teams. Uh, they sound like they got some exciting programs going on. And, of course, thank you to NASA for working with us on no this pictures. forward-looking program. On behalf of Northrop Grumman and our partners, we are excited to be part of the next step in the commercialization of space. Our Cygnus spacecraft has been providing the International Space Station commercial cargo services since 2013. Cygnus, so we see this like as just bigness. one of the next steps for our Northrop Grumman human space exploration team. Uh, our Northrop Grumman commercial space station design uses the current flight system, such as our Cygnus spacecraft, the mission extension I mean, vehicle, like, yeah. as well as the habitation and logistics outpost, the HALO module, which is currently in design and production for NASA's Gateway. Uh, this allows for low risk, rapid deployment. Uh, that's a good idea. We're also going to design in expansion and growth Yo. capability to meet the growing needs of the future space economy. Good call. So our first element provides the facilities, the infrastructure capable of supporting four crew members with one launch, which minimizes our time to operations. Smart. And once that element one is on orbit, we quickly follow up with the cargo and crew vehicles no, to begin full-time operations. It's a, this is so gateway in lower orbit. That's a good idea. Members, with plans to extend to eight person group, and then even further capability beyond that, again, as the market supports it. I'll tell and you the so. station is designed for a permanent presence of 15 years. We're going to utilize an overlapping stage approach. It sounds very similar to what a lot of uh, the other folks are, are thinking. It minimizes initial costs and gets the revenue stream uh, flowing as early as possible to offset subsequent development in uh, the following modules. We'll have multiple docking ports to allow future modules and capabilities to be added, again, in conjunction with and according to the market needs. We could launch element one early enough to, easily early enough to enable a smooth transition from the International Space Station and, and then all the base, uh, the ISS-based LEO missions in transition over to our commercial space station. Uh, to support this effort, Northrop Grumman is building a team with some key expertise, which right now includes Dynetics, who brings some incredible experience to the team, and we anticipate we'll be announcing others in the uh, upcoming months. So that's all nice from, from me. I'd like just again to say thank you to NASA for the partnership, and, and we are looking forward to continuing to build the future the of commercial space in LEO and beyond. Thank you. Nice. Great, thank you. And uh, now we will go over to questions. Now that we have com That's cool. completed our opening so, remarks, guys, they, a reminder: um, if you're on the phone bridge, please okay. press star so one to commercial stations by the late 2020s to enable that smooth transition. Uh, the inspector. The first question goes to Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good afternoon. A question, probably for Phil or Angela. Uh, the Inspector General report earlier this week about ISS and commercial space stations expressed some skepticism about the schedules that you're talking about. Um, it said specifically that no it believed a commercial platform is not likely to be ready until after 2030. Um, what gives you the, the confidence looking at these proposals and, and your own experience to believe that you will have uh, one or more commercial stations by the late 2020s no, to enable that new trend? from the ISS. Well, I'll, I'll start off, but then I'm going to let each one of the companies talk about their readiness uh, to support um, our desire not to have a gap uh, and to transition from the ISS by 2030. But with respect to the OIG report, um, I agreed with it. A gap, what they said primarily is a gap in U.S. human presence in LEO would be disastrous for the LEO economy and it would hamper NASA's ability to perform the research that we need to perform in LEO after the retirement of the ISS. That's one of our talking points, actually, uh, is that a gap would be bad, and that is exactly why we're making these awards today, to help ensure that there is no gap. Um, they also cited a bunch of challenges in there. Um, I agreed with all of those challenges, and again, I think these awards today uh, either address or significantly mitigate almost all of the challenges identified in the OIG report. So um, uh, I agree with the report, and I think if there was anything that we could do today that would um, increase our confidence, it's exactly what we've done, which is uh, expand 
the capabilities and expand the competitive landscape uh, so that we could eventually be successful prior to the deorbit or, or the retirement of the ISS. But uh, I'll let each one of the companies talk about their readiness of their concepts. So, uh, so this is um, this is Brent at Blue Origin. So uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, we're going in the in the same order we went at the beginning, in case you guys are wondering. Um, and so I just say two quick okay, things. Brent. One is uh, with respect to um, calendar feasibility, it's very important that we all work on um, sustaining and growing stakeholder support for what NASA is trying to do. Um, and so that means at OMB, it means on the Hill, um, it is uh, critically important that the West not lose its foothold in, uh, in LEO and have a gap, as Phil said. Um, with respect to technical readiness, I would simply say that um, there are two pieces to an end-to-end -end service. There's transportation and destination. Um, all of our transportation elements uh, will be flying over the next few years. Um, they've all been deep in development for years. And with respect to the destination systems, uh, we're building already. I'll stop there. Hey, this is Jeff Manber. Um, I, you know, I can't believe that a decade can't after hear you, Jeff. Uh, commercial Just cargo was launched, uh, folks are still questioning the robustness and uh, ingenuity and flexibility of the commercial pathway. So, um, sure, there are challenges going forward, but as Phil said, um, who had experience in commercial cargo, uh, that, you know, we have a robustness, we have multiplicity of providers working this, uh, and so this is exactly the right way to go forward on risk mitigation, um, to have multiple so. providers on the commercial Sonic. pathway. Thanks, so that's sort of a macro answer for I, the confidence that uh, I have on uh, the uh, all of the uh, folks chosen today, but on a more technical level, let me turn it over to my colleague uh, Kirk Scheim. And Kirk, um, can really you just maybe dig going. in a little bit on the technical aspects? You bet. Uh, first, I'd like to say I agree completely with Phil um, uh, that uh, you know who's Phil. The fact that uh, there might be a gap is a reason for starting immediately, not a reason for. For not starting, That's so right. really happy that we had this announcement today. That we're moving forward. Again, technically, the, the technologies, the uh, the uh, equipment, the habitats um, that we that we are using for Starlab are uh, under development today. So, um, yes, if you if you had nothing uh, at all and you right. fired the starting pistol, uh, it's it's a big challenge. But all these things are uh, are currently in development today. Um, we're leveraging the experience that uh, that, that Nanorax um, and that Lockheed Martin have to uh, to go and build this and this space station, and I, I believe it's certainly feasible to uh, meet yeah, the so schedule we... that we've laid out in our uh, agreement with NASA. And like uh, Brent said oh, today, um, the, the really cool thing about uh, commercialization word. of space is is you can go buy some services uh, to transport transport things today. So uh, they exist Transported today, and there'll be more in the future. And we're looking forward to leveraging those capabilities. Thank you. <laughs> I love that Jeff went savage. The, the guy okay. from Boston's like, I can't North believe you're questioning so, this. Yeah, this is a good a idea, guy. The hell's the matter but with you? Our plan is to leverage, you know, the operational hardware that we currently are operating and hardware that is currently under production, such as the Halo Habitat. That's a good it, idea. It really lowers the technical risk. That's a really good idea. The other part idea. of that is in our, our design, it starts relatively small with a lot of growth potential built into it, and that allows us to get something up early and then also grow it as the market uh, shows uh, that it's responding that's to the most. Uh, that's the most feasible, built. that one. Thanks. Easy. This guy. Uh, this and I'll just here. Uh, say one closing remark. Again, Jeff, don't forget Axiom. Axiom's been working for about two years now on their concept. Don't forget so, about them, uh, Jeff. To echo what a lot of people said, we're not starting from scratch. A lot of the partners that I went out today so had some experience with our next step proposals, and they were able, or next step agreements uh, that NASA's had for several years. So, again, not starting from scratch, uh, and certainly Axiom is, is well in. Um, well into their development phase. Thank you. Don't forget about them, Jeff. Okay, thank you all for that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I found that response. funny. But he's right. he's right, he's right, he's not wrong. From Elizabeth Powell for space.com. 
Hi, thanks for taking my call. This is probably for Phil. Can you also bring us up to date on how the negotiations right, are going for a possible extension of the International Space Station's uh, international agreement past 2024? Yeah, that's a great question. I've got my colleague, Robin Gatins, who is the director of the ISS program at NASA headquarters uh, on the call, and I'll defer that to her. Hi, uh, yes, everyone. Um, so we've been discussing ISS extension with our stakeholders, both in the administration and in Congress. And I can say that, you know, they are supportive. They recognize that both ISS extension and enabling these new commercial space stations are needed to avoid a gap in LEO, and that's uh, that's very important uh, to all of our stakeholders. I can't tell you today when a, a formal announcement will be made that's uh, kind of in their hands, but I, I can tell you we have strong support. Thank strong. you, Robin. Next question comes from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Ooh, this should be fun. Uh, good afternoon, and <clears throat> congratulations to everyone on, on the awards. Uh, first question is for Phil. Um, you know, of these awards, you know, Phil, how much is actually funded by Congress? And I know I think Brent mentioned the fact that you need to work with stakeholders, but, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot of money here, and, and so far there's not a whole lot of money in the budget for commercial EO destinations from Congress. And then question for the company right. representatives, to the extent you're willing, could you provide a rough order of the magnitude of costs for the initial configuration of your facilities. Thanks very much. Eric, so with respect to the first part of your question, uh, let me just be clear that we are going to follow all congressional direction regarding COMLEO destinations. To fully fund these awards, we do require the yeah, budget that was in the President's FY21 budget request. Um, however, should we fail to receive those appropriations in FY22, um, we could rephase some of the milestones to accommodate reduced levels of funding. I hope not to have to do that, uh, but if we get the President's full budget request, we should be fine. Um, and we should also be able to fund these initial activities uh, while we're under the current continuing resolution. We've looked at that very carefully. Um, I just saw in the press today that the CR might get extended to mid-February. We should still be fine, uh, even if that's the case. If we got a full-year CR, um, that's that's on the top of my Santa wish list as to what not to have, is not to have a full-year CR. Uh, but if we did have that, we would Continuing obviously have resolution. to do some replanning, uh, most likely. Um, but we've had a lot of discussion, and I think this, uh, these awards today uh, the progress that we've made with Axiom, the progress that we've made with private astronaut missions, uh, the progress that we've made on the demand side and everything that CASIS is doing, uh, and I'm personally uh, hopeful um, that that is making a difference with uh, all of our stakeholders in the administration and Congress and, and the public, uh, that we will, we will do what we plan to do. We're executing on our plans, like we said. So, and so uh, I'm hopeful the announcement today uh, just furthers that uh, that confidence. I'll jump in uh, on the second question to industry. Um, so the the remember these are uh, funded space act agreements for public private partnerships, and so our development programs are um, commercial business cases. And so I doubt that any of the competitors are going to directly answer your question about development cost. Um, however, what I will say, uh, same thing I said uh, when we announced Orbital Reef in Dubai, um, it much more, much better than an order of magnitude less than what it costs to develop the International Space Station. And there are multiple reasons for that, not least of which is something yeah, that's, that's been mentioned already in this call, which is that we're not starting from scratch. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and most of, if not all, of the problems that or the challenges that need to be worked to have a commercial LEO destination uh, have already been solved by the International Space Station program. So that's, that's the explanation for why we can develop a commercial space station for so much less than it cost NASA the first time. And I'd follow on with Brent. I didn't get unmuted quick enough before, but um, 
Brett's right. Uh, we have already in, uh, invested a lot of work in a lot of our infrastructure so far. Um, we already have, for instance, that large integrated flexible environment uh, or life module. Um, it's already developed. It's already full scale. It's sitting down at KSC, uh, Kennedy Space Center, and the Space Station Processing Facility. We've already undergone a lot of testing on it. So certainly not starting from scratch there. We've already put a lot of internal uh, investment into that, as well as the Dream Chaser, obviously. Um, and it will fly. We have a window at the end of next year, starting in November, which will go through February of 2023. Um, and that's our first maiden launch of Dream Chaser. So obviously well into development and almost ready to you know, get it into its environmental testing prior to shipment down to Florida. So um, already a lot of investment made. A lot of, will continue to be made, but I agree with Brent. We, we can't really go into those numbers. Well, at least you Boy, had a phone at the uh, risk of sounding uh, redundant here, this is Jeff Manber. Um, what up, Jeff? I'll, I'll approach, uh, I'll be evasive, uh, Eric, from a different angle uh, and say that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're so pleased to be uh, partnering with uh, Lockheed is the investments that they've made in the inflatable uh, technologies as well as so many other things that Lockheed brings to the table. At Nanoracks, we, we look at, uh, you know, the two decades of understanding the uh, commercial LEO marketplace. Um, we got, um, you know, ahead of us uh, a period of doing right the trades, looking at, you know, who, who are the remaining members of our team and, and how do we do the, contra you know, how do we work the contributions um, and our first initial customers. So, yeah, this it, it's premature now to, to give you a, a, a price and a cost, et cetera. So um, I'll just Starlet's echo what everyone is saying no, here. That it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive work in progress. So thank you. Rick Mastracchio from Northrop. Yeah, it's hard to say at this early stage. It's part of what phase one is all about. And we will determine the exact cost because there there's still many major trades to make. Spoiler, Pat, yeah, and again, the commercial market, the cost is going to be driven by the commercial market, what the market is asking for. Uh, so that will be part of it. And, and like everybody says, it's going to be obviously much lower cost than the International Space Station, much lower operating cost uh, than the International State Space Station, only Steak because space the, uh, so much effort has been done I love uh, by, uh, by Northrop Grumman and, and many other companies involved in the space station. Okay, thank you all. Our next question comes from Michael Sheets of CNBC. Mikey. Hey everybody, appreciate you uh, doing this press conference. I have a question for Phil on the cost side of things. Obviously, these are initial development contracts, and you know, great to have the 400 million to seed the conceptual development. But uh, over the cost, the life of the program, how much does uh, NASA expect to try to contribute uh, as these programs uh, evolve over, you know, to op an operational status? And my second question is for Rick, which is all these other guys they got. Star Lab, Orbital Reef. Uh, you, do you guys have a fun nickname for your station over at Northrop Grumman? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, and I think I'll echo what Rick said in the previous question, which is that's what Phase 1 is all about, uh, Michael. I think it's part of what Phase 1 is all about, is to figure out what those um, future uh, full costs are going to be, um, what percentage of that NASA is going to be. Uh, you know, I have some guesses, but they're just guesses at this point. And that's the whole reason why we didn't sort of rush into a services contract right now. Uh, we felt like it would be premature. Um, while the companies aren't starting from scratch, they're, you know, they're not close to being finished either. We still have several years of development, and I'll, there's still a lot of technical challenges that they're going to have to overcome. And as Rick said, a lot of trades that have to be made, which will um, – which will alter the costs going forward. And a lot of decisions have to be made about the specific technical configurations that haven't been made yet. So uh, I would just say TBD, I don't have any definitive answers, and that's what phase one is all about, is to help refine uh, both the um, cost side of the equation, but also the market side of the equation. I'd like to see a couple more years of um, cases doing its activities, some of these commercial opportunities that we've announced on the ISS. We've seen some um, traction on uh, marketing and other activities that, since we've expanded the use of ISS. And I think we need a 
few more years of that to uh, see how that evolves and how that plays in. And we think by the mid part of the decade, that's when we will be able to make definitive decisions. And that's why we've uh, done this two-phase strategy that we that we've done. Uh, so okay, that's and uh, this one. is Rick, and that's and a that's great question, uh, Michael, about what's uh, our space station name going to be. And uh, all I could say is we have several under consideration right now, and uh, we're hoping we'll release something pretty soon here. Thanks. You should just call it Jeff. All right, well, stay tuned for more news on that. The next question is from Irene Klotz of Aviation Transportation Contract. Oh, Thanks, sorry. Stephanie. Um, for uh, Bill, is it NASA's intention to retain the um, transportation contracts for crew and cargo in the commercial destinations era? And uh, separately for Rick, are there any plans to upgrade Cygnus for a crew? Thanks for crew launches. Yeah, Irene, I'll say uh, for this phase, we did request that the bidders propose end-to-end -end commercial LEO destination concepts, including transportation. Don't worry about it, Ian. Yeah. However, we haven't determined the final transportation requirements for phase two at this time, uh, so we may fold it in to the phase two contracts, or we may continue to purchase it uh, separately. Regardless of how it gets contracted, uh, the NASA astronauts will be transported to and from commercial destinations on NASA certified crew transportation systems. Uh, oh. So the commercial crew program has got a long and prosperous life uh, ahead of it. So the first question That's was they're going to continue to need to do the kinds of things that they're doing. How we do the actual contracting is uh, is sort of TBD. Uh, as you guys know, currently SpaceX is currently certified to transport crew. Uh, we expect Boeing to receive certification soon, and there may be other certified systems. Uh, by the you hear that right there? That's why Boeing is so committed to Starliner, because they're anticipating a commercial low Earth orbit market with Starliner. And if you have one of two ways to get up there to multiple stations, there's no way one fleet, a fleet of dragons would be able to service all those stations. And that's probably by design. That's a good idea. That's why Boeing's so damn committed to it. And that's why, in the scheme of things, they don't care if it gets delayed a couple, six or seven months. It's not a big deal. Because in the future, when this thing goes through, they'll make bank off that thing. Makes sense. Um, would you be able to say, you and also Jeff, what transportation companies you proposed in your... Um... Actually, let me back it up. It will continue to enter carrier volume. We're adding additional... Okay, and hi, Irene. Uh, good question about Cygnus. We are constantly upgrading Cygnus. We're making it... We're increasing the inter carrier volume. We're adding additional capabilities, external, reboost to space station, et cetera. And we've been doing that for many years. And we are, will continue to upgrade Cygnus to support commercial destination and, and, and any, anybody's commercial destination. But no, there's no uh, expectation that Cygnus will carry crew members. That would be... Uh... Um, would you be able to say, you and also Jeff, what transportation companies you proposed in your, um, in your projects? Oh, uh, this is Jeff. Um, we're working. Uh, we're working the trades. We have a couple of opportunities, and I think it was Phil who said, um, or one of one of the folks who said, you know, we have some time here to work all this out. Um, and so we're in discussion with a few of the folks. But you can work backwards, uh, Irene, and figure out who the logical players are. But no, we're not ready yet to uh, sign the launch uh, contract at this time. That will be in a little bit of time. I like Jeff. Yeah, and from the <laughs> same thing, we, we, we talked to the obvious uh, crew, uh, crew transport providers, amazing. Boeing and SpaceX. It's literally in the but, picture. But uh, no uh, agreements or final decisions have been made. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Irene. Uh, the next uh, question comes from Wired. I believe it's Ramin. Oh, that yes, was that's good. right. I like that. Uh, thank you all for doing this press conference. Um, I, I have a, uh, a practical question. Um, I hope it's not a dumb question, but, but, but something that's not very clear to me. This, this is for uh, the, the, the three uh, company representatives especially. Um, something that's not clear to me is, is how is it going to work with, um, you know, having the, the ability to have science operations, that, you know, the science activities, the experiments that uh, are traditionally done on the ISS, especially with, you know, not just NASA, but all of the international uh, uh, partners, as well as um, you know, I'm, I'm presumably there will be 
you know, at some point frequently, uh, uh, you know, space tourists visiting. Um, and maybe eventually, like, by 2040, maybe there'll be two there at one time. So, I mean, is it, is it going to be, like, uh, um, I, I'm trying to picture it, you know, like with some of these, like, multiple modules, where there'll be one module that's sort of, like, the more tourist side, I guess, like a mini hotel, and then on another side, you know, with, with um, uh, experiments and everything like that, and maybe a, um, a shared kitchen or something. I, I'm just, I just want to be able to picture this, how, how this will work. It, yeah, so this is, this is brand at Blue Origin. I'll go first. Um, and that's not a dumb question at all. It's it's actually a very pertinent question, and uh, it gets at the essence of why we consider our concept as uh, or designing it as a mixed use business park. Brent's like, no, um, I got this. Which, you know, any mixed use development on Earth um, finds a way through architecture to blend disparate functions um, or even you know, mutually incompatible functions like retail and residential and industrial and so forth. Um, and so the our answer to your question is uh, what we call our zoned architecture um, that does exactly what you suggest. Uh, it separates habitation from laboratory uh, in different modules. Um, See these modules so, with the six windows? Know, one of our ground rules <laughs> from the beginning is you don't sleep in the lab. Um, on our space station, and that that's a sort of a, uh, a brief statement, but it's emblematic of how, as markets develop for more diverse applications, other industrial applications, media, entertainment, advertising, sports, and so forth, um, not just tourism, how those activities will be able to be reconciled. Um, the easiest thing See to imagine is dudes. essentially a dormitory where uh, all the habitation functions like exercising and eating and uh, socializing and sleeping occur separate from laboratory functions or manufacturing functions. Um, but that it's, same it's a space office approach uh, applies yes. to other applications as well. Literally mixed use zoning in space. That's what Orbit hey, is, is all Jeff about. Hey, this is Jeff Manberg. Look, if there's uh, anything Jeff. we learned in the past uh, uh, 10 or 15 years of working on the International Space Station, in my view, is that you know there'll never be another ISS. There'll never be that type of uh, space station uh, with multiple users um, next in proximity next to each other. Um, you know, know as the question implies, you don't want to, you know, an astronaut on a bicycle. Uh, next to folks who are there to, for a uh, little Zen solitude. Um, and, and so at uh, Star Lab, you know, what we're focused on initially is the George Washington Copper uh, Science Park. Um, I believe it's personally, I personally believe it's important as a spacefaring nation that we focus on uh, manufacturing, research, professional as astronauts, um, developing the technology and the skill set to go on to Mars one day. Um, and so uh, I do believe that uh, within the decade there will be different platforms for different market niches. Um, you know, we will have a hotel or two. We will have um, uh, uncrewed. We will have, um, uh, as we are focused on research and Mass in space manufacturing. Um, and so I think it's very exciting, and your question is spot on, uh, that we should not, uh, in our view, try and be everything at once. Uh, for all the markets, uh, because this is an emerging marketplace, and you really have to specialize in uh, the things that you know best. So yeah, thank I'll you. Go. I got a model of the rocket right here. And uh, Rick Mastracchio here again. I think that all three of us seem to be saying the very similar things. And, and like like them, our design is is modular. Uh, there, you know, of course, there's going to be the facilities and systems that, that provide the space station and the crew power and and life support and things like that and there's going to be science labs there's going to be the opportunity for dedicated habitation modules there's going to be the opportunity for cupolas and windows for earth observations and, and again I, I agree with everything this everybody is the else is saying in that uh, I it, there's going to have school. to be a certain level of separation for these things but it's also going to be driven and i keep saying it's going to have to be driven by the market and that's what we're going to be doing I know that Northrop Grumman is going to be concentrated on that uh, heavily, especially in the first year, to really determine what the markets are and then design Thank towards you. those markets. And But that flexibility to add other capabilities as the market evolves. Thank you. Thanks, great. Thank you all. Uh, and 
we have one question from Marsha Smith of Safe Policy Online. Thanks so much. I think my question is mostly for Robin, if she's still on the line, but the companies may want to comment on it as well. Uh, Robin, you talked about the status of negotiations with the White House and Congress about extending ISS to 2030. But could you bring us up to date on the negotiations with the partners, and especially with Russia? Is everybody on board for some future date, 2028, 2030? And as part of that, I'm curious, what happens to the partners in this transition? Is it basically a free-for-all, and each of them has to figure out where they're going to go they after ISS to... is no more? You know, do they... you know, in Eric's defense, they, they basically did. <laughs> they, told him to, they told him to piss off. <laughs> uh, that's kind of funny, actually. <laughs> oh, my goodness. On U.S. platforms instead of somebody else's platforms. How is all of that going to work out? Yeah, sure. Um, so the status of our partners back in July, I think we finalized it in September, all of our International Space Station international partners uh, at the space agency level um, signed a statement that that supported uh, extending the ISS to 2030. Um, you know, everyone has to go work within their own governments and their own government processes, you know, to uh, and timelines uh, for that to be official. But at the space agency level, uh, all the partners have, have indicated their support and frankly, they're kind of waiting for the U.S. to go first. Uh, regarding how is it going to work um, on these commercial space stations, we have actually kicked off uh, discussions with our space station international partners to start talking about that. And we, it's very important to us to keep all of our international partners together um, with this in this transition from ISS to these commercial space stations. The model, how is it going to work, could be, um, it, it's kind of wide open right now. We're first trying to, to find out what their long-term needs are <clears throat> in low Earth orbit. We're, we, as we've been refining our own uh, needs, we're trying to find out what they're interested in and then talk about, you know, what sort of arrangement uh, would work out. So. Hmm. Uh, very important to us, very important to our administration. Interesting. All right. Well, guys, uh, I think that I think they said that was the last question. We got a SpaceX launch coming. Uh, we got a Starlink launch. So I'm going to switch this over to SpaceX Starlink launch coverage. Let's jump into that. Uh, it should be getting up here soon. Um, did you guys have any questions? Uh, Eric was basically fishing for costs, no doubt, because Thomas, can you give me a source for SpaceX bidding Starship for that project? SpaceX link. Thank you. I have time for the Neutron video. Uh, I mean, no, uh, Shaw. Uh, SpaceX did bid, from what I understand. Um, I'm pretty sure Eric was fishing for cost questions so he could compare it to Starship and say that Starship was a better idea. That sounds like something he'd do. And you know what? He's probably right, to be honest with you. But, see, the thing is, is that everybody told them to piss off because they don't know how much it's going to cost. Like, they don't know. They, you don't know. This stuff's complicated, man. You won't like the source. Let me see. Did Eric say that? Let me see. So that see that makes even more sense now that he's asking about cost. These are pretty significant awards that will help each company move forward with the design of their space stations. There's also a nice mix of a sure thing, Northrop, an expensive palace blue, and a newcomer, Nanoracks. Yeah, Northrop's design is the best one. Um, no offense against blue. I, I'm pretty sure they have the chops to be able to do it. But I like that Northrop's, Northrop's space station, guys, the commercial space station that they proposed, is Gateway. It's just Gateway in low Earth orbit. That's smart. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Uh, that, that, I like that. That's really smart. That's a really great proposal, to be honest with you. I don't think Blue Origin should be dropped at all. No, we want more money. 
NASA has awarded the booster production and operations contract to Northrop Grumman to build boosters for SLS to support nine flights. Hey. All right. Hey. Hey. No, really? Hold up. Oh. Mr. Puddin's doing some background work there. Not bad. Okay. Good. Good, 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 good. Yeah. Yeah, Tessa. Now all we need is a block by for the six core stages. Unless that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they have Artemis 1, 2, and 3. The core stages for 1, 2, and 3. Hey, all right. Oh, please. If Bill does the block by, I will stop making fun of him immediately. I'm, I'm serious. Uh, if he... If he... If he gets that block by done, I will stop making fun of him. I mean, I probably won't, but... I'm gonna need to eat a whole... But nope. I'm not gonna eat humble pie, Chad. I'm gonna eat humble pudding. Discovery, go at throttle up. <laughs> that's good. Wow, that's really good news. Excellent. Can I have my jello? Will you eat your hat? No, 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 no. Bill said the proof is in the pudding, and uh, I, I I doubted him. So if he's able to do it, if they get if NASA block buys SLS cores, I will not eat my hat. I will eat humble pie, except that humble pie will be pudding. Cause the proof is in the pudding, dudes. That's actually pretty good news. I'm really 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 hype on that. And Northrop with the gate, basically having the Halo module, guys. The Halo module is being made right now. Uh, just. Just on a side note, um, here, let me show you. Uh, there was a picture of it that actually came by very recently in the feed. I'm not sure where it ended up. They're working, they're, they're building the Halo module right now, which is pretty dope. Uh, they scrubbed the Galileo launch. There was a Soyuz that was supposed to be launching from French Guiana, guys didn't go. Uh, they did scrub it. And it wasn't because of the rocket. Dimitri made that very clear. <laughs> I will eat tapioca pudding on stream. Dead crew. Yeah, no doubt. Launch conditions are looking uh, pretty good. Pretty good. STS is ready for launch. They're building a halo habitation and logistics outpost. Falcon 9 has cleared the tower. Soyuz does not scrub. Do not get confused. No. Vasya, Dimitri made it very clear that it was not the rocket that caused the delay. <laughs> I love how he does that every time. He's like, no, it was not the rocket. Nope. Nope. Rocket is good. That, I like that. That's cool. <laughs> it's Chad move. It's not my rocket. Tori Bruno did the same thing. You remember that? You remember that? Rocket performed fine. Good evening, it's Thursday, December 2nd, and you're looking at a Chad live move. view of Falcon 9 as it awaits its 6.12 p.m. <coughs> launch from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Oh, there it is. Thank My you. name is Andy Tran. Andy? I'm a quality engineer here at SpaceX, joining you from our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Thank you for tuning in for our 18th launch of Starlink this year and SpaceX's 27th mission of 2021. I'll tell you in a Starlink is a satellite internet constellation designed and manufactured by SpaceX that can provide high-speed, low-latency internet to people living in remote and rural locations around the globe. Yeah, Today's boy. launch will be our fourth rideshare mission of the year. Yeah, this yeah, launch will be a longer up. one as we are reverting to a circular orbital insertion, which requires two burns of the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. We are doing this as it is a mission requirement for our rideshare customer flying on board tonight. Inside the fairing at the top of the rocket, there are 48 Starlink satellites and two Black Sky satellites. Those are Black Sky ones. is a global I monitoring think, well, company that combines space assets with advanced AI and machine learning analysis to provide customers a first-to-know advantage. I'll share a few more details about no. these payloads a bit later in the webcast. No. Uh, as for the 48 Starlink satellites, they will be inserted into low-Earth orbit and bring us one step closer to near global coverage of the populated world in 2021. The latest weather forecast shows about 90% favorable chance of liftoff today. The vehicle, the satellites, and range are all looking good to support an on-time liftoff just uh, over 11 minutes from now. 
Uh, let's take a closer look at the rocket that you see on screen. Let's. Falcon 9, our two-stage launch vehicle, stands about 70 meters tall, and when it's fully fueled, it'll hold just over yeah, 1 million high. pounds of nice. propellant that the vehicle will burn through in less than three minutes after liftoff. We prep Falcon 9 for launch in our hangar at the base of the pad. Upon completing final checkouts, Falcon 9 rolled out to the pad with the Starlink and Black Sky payloads and went vertical on Monday around 5 p.m. Eastern time. From there, we had successful static fire of our nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage yesterday. The bottom two thirds of the vehicle is what we refer to as the first stage. Probably you may be able to see the SIP markings left over from this booster's previous eight flights supporting the GPS 3-3 mission, Turksat 5A, Transporter 2, and five previous Starlink missions. The first stage accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere into space with the help nice. of nine Merlin engines at the base of the rocket. Following separation from the second stage, we'll be attempting to recover our first stage for a ninth time on our do. drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, ASOC. staged off the coast of Florida oh, in the Atlantic yeah, Ocean. You can see it on screen right now. If successful, it will make the 89th recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage and 96 total first stage landings if you include our Falcon Heavy booster recoveries. Internet satellites, dude. On top of the first stage is the black carbon fiber interstage, and then on top of that is the Falcon 9 right second truck. stage, which has a single Merlin, Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine. Once the first and second stages separate at about two and a half minutes into the mission, the MVAC engine will ignite and carry the Starlink satellites and two black sky satellites to a low Earth orbit around the Earth. The stack of satellites is safely enclosed inside of the 17-foot diameter payload fairing, uh, which you see on screen right now. This protects the payload from aerothermal loads, heating, and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space, <laughs> Yo, like we will jettison the fairing as the second stage continue, <laughs> continues its journey to orbit. Just as we reuse the Falcon 9, we recover and reuse our fairing halves as well. The fairing halves we're using today are brand new, and we're going to be attempting to recover these halves using our recovery vessel, Bob. <laughs> Propellants have been loading on the vehicle since the T-minus 35-minute mark. The Falcon vessel, 9 no is joke. a bi-propellant vehicle, which means it uses two propellants, a fuel Four, and an two, oxidizer. Two, an oxidizer is a type of chemical that a fuel requires bomb. in order to burn. A Most things bit. here on Earth burn using oxygen, uh, which is readily available in the Earth's atmosphere. But in space, case? there is no atmosphere to provide oxygen or other oxidizers, so the rocket needs to carry up their own. In Falcon 9's case, it's super chilled liquid oxygen yeah, called right. LOX. The liquid oxygen is chilled well below its boiling point so that it can become what we call densified, which means it has a much greater amount of mass per volume, and we can load more of it onto the booster. For fuel, we use a refined form of kerosene known as RP-1. In addition it. to its propellants, Falcon 9 also needs an ignition source in order to go, and for that we use the chemical TTEB, or triethyl aluminum and, and triethyl borane. Currently, fuel is uh, nearly fully loaded on the first stage and starting to load on the second stage. Once all tanks are full, both stages will continue to be topped off with propellant until about the T-minus two-minute mark to nice, keep temperatures Thomas. as cold I'm as have possible. have to read about that. That's a good thing. Again, weather is looking fantastic for tonight's liftoff. Uh, the vehicle and satellites uh, in the fairing, um, they are uh, remaining good as well. Uh, we are targeting an on-time liftoff just under seven and a half minutes from now. Yeah, Drog, welcome to the East Coast, man. Dude, the, the, I'm in Boston. The sun went down like two hours ago, dude. And as I, I mentioned I earlier, today's floor. mission marks the, the fourth official down. mission under SpaceX's SmallSat rideshare program this year, which gives small satellites flexible access to what is now the most flown operational rocket in the United States, the Falcon 9. Tonight, we're flying 48 Starlink satellites to make room for two Black Sky the payloads flex. from our oh, customer space flight. In an effort to, make, to help Black Sky rapidly expand its growing constellation of high revisit satellites, Space Flight Incorporated is managing the launch of these two additional Black Sky high resolution, multi spectral Gen 2 satellites to low Earth orbit, expanding Black Sky. It's a camera. It's a camera satellite. Those words were nice, but you could just say it's a camera. So. So there's a, there's a stack of Starlink, two stacks of Starlink satellites kind of side by side in here. And then on top, literally just sitting on top of those satellites and just bolted to the top of the Starlink satellites is the Black Sky satellite. Black Sky is a, uh, a commercial imaging company. They, they make observation satellites. 
uh, that like take pictures of the ground and stuff for maps and whatever, um, or or any type of other thermal imaging, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, it, that satellite, the Black Sky satellite, is about the size of an engine block. It, it's like maybe a car engine or something, not a Tesla engine, like an act, like a big, big, bigger V8. It's a big satellite. Well, not really. It's on the top of the Starlink satellite. SpaceX is using the aggregate room in that payload bay, payload bay, the fairing, um, to just yeet other small sats up into space, which is pretty cool. The same black sky that will fly five missions on Electron. That's correct, Swishio. Yep, yep. Other way around? What's the other way around? vehicle known as the transporter erector we also refer to it as the te it will begin to start to retract away from the falcon 9 vehicle right, so we have the vents open. The preparation on for the retracting the te clamp arms will open up and then the transporter erector we will have vents open on the first and second stage indicating that both of them are full of fuel well not full they're close then at T0, uh, they're almost topped off the TE even further away from falcon 9 as it lifts off that actually looks to be pretty damn low humidity in florida tonight goalie how's the weather down there the transport director is also the structure that provides... Starlink is on top of the Black Sky gases, satellite? Are you sure? Uh, electrical connections uh, to the second This will be the ninth flight of this booster. It flew eight times. Space. Five Starlink missions, uh, GPS, Turksat, and uh, Transporter 2, and then five Starlinks. Are you sure, Dish? The last time they put the Black Sky and satellite up on the top, it's up here. Propellants. Not really, so Sawyer, but I'm off, putting on a brave face, dude. No idea. I'm in Homestead. Oh, okay. 65 Fahrenheit low is humidity. I, yeah, I can tell it's not very humid because of the condensation. So, you can usually... Oh, there they go. Clamp arms are opening. Strong back will move to 88 degrees. Um, you can tell that it's actually pretty low humidity down in Florida is because you could... So, you could see that this thing is full of fuel. You could just barely see it, though. The reason why you could just barely see it is because... Uh, well, when the booster gets cold, when they fill it up with propellants, right? The metal, the aluminum tube on the outside of Falcon 9 that's on the outside gets really cold too. And what that does is because it's so damn cold, it condenses stuff on the outside. Same reason why when you pull like a, a drink out of the fridge, right? It, it On a hot day, it gets, it condenses on the outside. It, it, it takes some of the water vapor in the atmosphere and turns it into water. <laughs> so... Can we just appreciate that this is the 122nd orbital launch attempt of 2021? We can appreciate that, dude. Still working, Terry. Gotcha, gotcha. 66 Fahrenheit, 62 humidity. That's actually really low for Florida. So, because it's not condensing as much on the outside of the booster, you can tell it's low humidity. It's a nice night. Dude, these nights are perfect, man. I, I, miss, I miss these nights in Florida. Nights in the winter, it's nice. 60, 70 degrees, no humidity, and all you can hear is the frogs and the crickets. I love it. It's really, it's really relaxing, to be honest. It's, it's, it's great, actually. <laughs> How about mosquitoes? Ah, you don't have to worry about that. Just get some bug spray. What about the gators and the cats? Well, it's very simple. You don't, you, yet you, you have. So in Florida, guys. Everybody has a pool in their backyard. Well, not everybody, but most people have a pool, but they also have screens covering the pool so the, so the pool doesn't turn into a swamp and keeps the bugs out. The frogs, the crickets, and the falcons. I love it, dude. It's so relaxing, dude. I used to go out on my porch uh, in Orlando. Like you can see Cocoa Beach over there. I used to go out on my porch in Orlando and sit just out there doing work and just listen to the crickets it's great it's great focusing great focusing and here's some merlins hopefully just get gator repellent or just have an apartment that's not on the ground floor <laughs> yeah it, it is doddle it's quite nice quite relaxing okay we're almost topped off here one of the last indicators that the falcon 9 is full of fuel is the transporter erector will purge out all the liquid oxygen inside of it they'll they'll back purge the the system with nitrogen uh and you'll see all the liquid oxygen shoot out the side of the TE over here. One of the final indicators that they're going to go for launch here. Like and that. Those, those hissing and popping. That is normal and expected. Like that. At this stage in the countdown. 
You don't want fuel in the transporter erector when the rocket launch, because it's about when the rocket launches. It's about to get hot right here. Having oxidizer and fuel in there can set the, the launch pad on fire. I don't think I need point, to say why you wouldn't want to do propellant that. Propellant has been fully loaded As on if you the vehicle, do. and we are just under a minute away. Uh, both stages 40, should be beginning to Cape pressurize for liftoff. It's, it's Cape Canaveral. It's in Florida. Okay, so the, once again, the TE purge cloud isn't even that big, indicating low humidity. That's gaseous oxygen coming out here, there, and there. You'll see them close the vents so here. We are pretty much 40 right seconds away. Go. Let's listen in to terminal count as we prepare for liftoff of the 48 have Starlink you, satellites do and the two Black Sky satellites. <laughs> Drog, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds and counting. All right. Let's fly. So you should see the sound suppressors turn on down here right before the rocket lifts off. They'll, prime, seconds they'll prime the system and then they'll go. 10. T minus five, four, three, two, one, zero, ignition, lift off. Nominal power and telemetry. So we are about a minute into liftoff. Falcon 9 has successfully yeah. lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 Three, at Cape Canaveral Space Super Force Sonic. Station. Okay. In just a few seconds here, barrier. we are expecting the call for max seconds. Q. That is the period where the vehicle experienced the highest amount of aerodynamic pressures. It is, Tessa. Starlink stats are heavy, especially with that Black Sky satellite on there. Max Q. Maximum dynamic pressure. And there was the call out. Peak aerodynamic. So now load. that we've gone uh, past the period of highest stresses on the vehicle, we so have. So basically, while they're on the way up, guys, Falcon 9 is still somewhat in the atmosphere. So there's a point, there's a point in the flight where, like, Falcon 9 is going so fast and it's still down low, there it can't move the air out of the way. And what that ends up doing is puts a compression load on the booster. Everybody calls Max Q, but nobody ever says what it is. Uh, Falcon 9, that, that fairing, air is compressing up against the front of the fairing, and it's actually accordioning Falcon 9. In engineering, it's called compression load. So they throttle down for max Q. For the, they keep the dynamic pressure lower by throttling down the engines to not accordion the rocket. I mean, accordioning, doing, do, going, if your dynamic pressure gets too high, uh, you got to remember, these are like fuel tanks. They're, they're, fuel, they're like balloons, right? You wouldn't sit on a water balloon. That would be bad. It, yeah, that would also be bad for the rocket. So they keep the engine, they keep the, they, they throttle the engines down to make sure that the dynamic load, which is always changing because you're going up out of the atmosphere, right? The, the pressure goes down as you get higher. You can see that from the expanding gases, right? Um, oh, stand by for main engine cutoff here. Nico. We'll put compression load on the vehicle. Stage separation confirmed. Okay, there's a good separation at the stage of mission. So you can see on screen we had successful main engine cutoff uh, followed by stage separation and on the right hand side of the screen that Look, is the single the, Merlin vacuum the engine the second stage going the red hot. See that? Uh, on the left hand side of the screen is the view of our first stage. Uh, I think we're getting some views of the of twilight right now as the sun has just set uh, Florida. in the east coast. The coast. In a few seconds we are expecting fairing deploy and that will expose the satellites to the, the vacuum of space. MCS firing there. Okay, stand by for the fairing to pop off. Fairing separation confirmed. We got the, the audio and starlings. video confirmation on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, the fairing halves have deployed. We are going to attempt to recover those uh, using our recovery vessel Bob later on in the mission. Uh, for now, the 
Uh, mission is going great. Uh, again, like uh, the left-hand side is a view from the top of our first stage looking downward. Um, you can see little plumes of gas coming out. That is nitrogen uh, for our, uh, as part of our attitude North control John. system to help orient the, the first stage booster oh, properly as it makes its way back to attempt its... Monkey, Bob has a sister ship, you know? You know what it's called? Doug. No, I'm not making that up. That's solid nitrogen getting moving away from the vehicle there, in case anybody's wondering. Earlier, they are signal. on the Bermuda. opposite end. No, I'm not making that up. Seriously, SpaceX, Bob, and Doug, Google it right now. So I'm again, not they are um, going to be um, in this burn for <laughs> they another have couple two ships minutes that are literally um, named as Bob they and continue Doug. to make their way to low Earth orbit. Now, wh what's the? There's a joke there, right? No, not really. The first two people to fly on a SpaceX capsule were Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. They named it after the first two astronauts to fly on, on a SpaceX capsule. <laughs> All right. In order to make its way back to the uh, they do, drone right? ship, the first stage needs to execute two burns. I agree, Rimmel. Uh, yeah, the first a is an entry burn where three of the, the Merlin 1D engines uh, it looks like a will candle ignite. Going across uh, the this sky, helps dude. to slow the stage down as it re-enters the upper parts like of the Earth's atmosphere. The Indeed, second burn is the landing burn. This is a single engine burn, and this will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly Bob in order to land sisters? on our what? drone ship. Trajectory nominal. That first burn, the entry burn, is expected to start around T plus six minutes and Just 22 seconds and last for about 20 seconds. Okay, so over here, this is a shot looking up out the top of the first stage. This is where the second stage engine would have been. Uh, you So during staging, we saw the business end of the second stage uh, get popped off. This is looking down, as Andy just said here. You can see that the, the attitude control thrusters, the ACS, which is a cold gas thruster. It's basically, you, you, know, you know the thruster that, thruster, you know the like keyboard cleaners that t -t -t -t, it's literally that, but it's with nitrogen. They use inert gas. You don't want to use like CO2 or something. Uh, CO2 behaves very bad under, well, not under pressure, but nitrogen is better. You, you'd want an inert gas, something that's non-reactive. So they use nitrogen, uh, keeps it simple. But yeah, the, that's what those thrusters are here. So in a second, what you're going to see is Falcon 9, it's going to fire its engines, uh, when it starts to get entry heating, you can see a little bit of entry heating happening right there around the bottom of the vehicle. Um, it's going to fire the engines, and that en th what that's designed to do is basically push the re-entry heating away from the rocket. It's slowing down the rocket, too, right? Because the rocket has a lot of momentum. Falcon 9's first stage goes way above the Kármán line. Uh, oh, see some re-entry some re-entry heating there. Okay, so the engines right there are pushing the, the plasma that happens from re-entry away from the vehicle. That, that right there is Falcon 9's heat shield. Oh, God, that's so damn cool. I needed a rocket launch, man. It's called... Chat, what is it called? Supersonic retropropulsion. Supersonic retropropulsion. That's actually an idea that was pioneered by NASA for landing stuff on the surface of Mars. They usually lose connection here for a second. How many G's do you think on a booster during re-entry burn for the booster? It's it's a lot, Reverell. Yeah. He said the thing. What was that? I'm not 100% sure. Engine performance on the second stage continues to go well. It slowed 100 kilometers an hour in 10 to 15 seconds. After we complete the landing burn, I wouldn't ride on it, Reverell. It would probably turn hurt. Off this engine <laughs> and enter a coast phase. Supermantic retroactive proposal. Yes. Yes. Why doesn't it melt? And as a well, GNAC, think about it like this. The rocket engine, the design is designed to take the heat of the rocket engine. And the rocket engine exhaust, well, obviously really freaking hot like i'm not gonna put my hand on that that would be very bad for for your hand if that's actually it's all about relative dude so the re-entry heating the plasma that that accumulates on the bottom of the vehicle it's not that the rocket it's like both of those things are hot right oh here we go with the landing burn the landing burn has begun it's just the rocket gases are less hot in just a few seconds here we're going to see if we can land this first stage booster for Herb. the ninth time Herb. Burp. Oh, that burp's about to get toasted. Take one, landing leg deploy. Landing legs have deployed. Come on, come down now. Oh! Almost uninterrupted all the way down. Nice. 
That looked good. We'll wait for the picture. Yep, yep, we're good. You can hear the cheer and the applause, and there's God the visual. Damn, that's cool. This first stage booster has landed nine times. This marks our 89th overall successful recovery oh, on the South 9 first stage. Cape. And the 129th successful stage flight of a saved. Falcon 9 FDS first saved. stage. Stand by for the call for NOI. It's so cool knowledge. So what we're waiting on now is confirmation of second engine cutoff as Not well as insertion. confirmation of a good orbital insertion. As I was speaking, we did get that confirmation. <sighs> um, so the second stage uh, with all I of its satellites so are entering it. a coast phase for about 50 minutes. We're going to leave you with some space tunes and we'll be back here Play new at astronauts. the T plus 59 minute mark. Play new astronauts. Damn it. So. Three, okay, so if you're wondering, you look at that, like, oh, that doesn't look like what, what's so what's so crazy about that? That first stage, guys, is a is 15 stories tall. <laughs> it's a 15 story building coming back, and it was just in space a second ago. Uh, it, it was it was 62 miles that way, which, which is pretty. Uh, uh, dude, look, that th that's very impressive. That's the. The technology here should not be understated. That's really freaking cool. Like, the, oh man. And it landed on a freaking barge. Yeah, how, how far was it off the bullseye? Let me check. Are the second stages always left to decay in Leo? They're usually disposed of, Sile. Yep. So if you're wondering why there's a lot of water and drops everywhere, what they do is they spray down the deck of the drone ship. Uh, they spray down to basically film cool the drone ship. So if you think about the rocket engine, the rocket engine is putting off a lot of heat. It's very hot right in this area here. See that? It, warm. Warmer than normal. Not like Arizona warm. Maybe a little bit warmer than that. Just people from Arizona, you know what I'm saying. So it, it, it's nice and warm here. So basically, so the rocket engine, they don't want it to melt the drone ship, right? Obviously, you don't want that to happen. So what they do is they spray a layer of water on here. And instead of the drone ship absorbing the heat and melting, the water turns to steam. And it film cools the deck of the drone ship so they don't damage it with the really, really, really hot rocket engine. That See all the steam that comes off right there when the rocket lands, that big white cloud? It's, all, it's just water vapor. Because it, it heats the water instead of the drone ship. Doesn't the water film interfere with the radar on the first stage? I mean, I mean, clearly not. <laughs> clearly not. <laughs> nice, John. There you go. Yeah, man. That the the technical impressiveness of this should not be understated. That is damn cool. And dude, seeing Super Heavy come back is gonna be insane. Yeah, nailed it, dudes. Nailed it. Let's see. I want to... Okay. Yeah, she's a little bit off, but that's okay. That, dude. <laughs> that's like a couple meters of deviation, which is nuts. That's 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 pretty... <laughs> I'm alright, is it? It'll be okay. The rocket launch made me a little happier. So far, no failed landings on a short fall of Gravitas, three for three. Cool. So right here, guys, you see the stack of Starlink satellites. I call SpaceX's Starlink satellite deployment mechanism literally 52 pickup in space. The Starlink satellites are stacked in two decks of cards, so to speak. And it would be like if you had a deck of cards with a rubber band and you let the rubber band go and the, the things went, you know? That's basically what happens. It's the 52 pickup, even though it's not 52 satellites, I don't think. Um, and then riding on top, riding on top of the um, of all those satellites is another uh, commercial Earth observation satellite from a company called Black Sky. Hold on, that's the difference between precise and accuracy. Yeah. Waiting for the first catch out of the air. Yep. Yeah. I mean, Atlanta, that's right here. 
That's not that much of a deviation considering how big one of those things is. Does the Black Sky Sat need to be ejected first? Yep. So right now they're in a parking orbit. They basically put it up into an orbit that is, long story short, not sustainable. <coughs> this orbit, the orbit that it's in right now will come back down in a couple of days if they don't do anything. The reason why they do that, it's, it's just basically playing it safe. So you don't have a bunch of, so you don't have like 60 Starlink debris, satellites full of debris just floating around. Um, this is called a parking orbit. The idea is that if something is wrong, you don't have, the, the mission will term, it'll self-terminate basically because of physics. It'll come back down. The earth will pull it back. Well, atmospheric perturbations, as atmospheric orbital perturbations is the right way to say that. Long story short, uh, it'll decay because there's still air up here at this altitude. Uh, it's just not a lot, but there still is air. Um, I wouldn't take your helmet off when you were up here, but, you know, not, not dense enough for us to breathe, but it's still enough to create drag on the vehicle. So they put it in a parking orbit right now, and in a little bit, they're going to fire the engines again, and it's going to get put up into its final insertion orbit. Now, even the insertion orbit, which is slightly eccentric, uh, it, it's... It's slightly elliptical, right? So it's not a perfect circle. They're in a perfect circle, so to speak, right now. They're going to boost boost the apogee up and make the orbit a little more eccentric, kind of egg-shaped almost. Uh, and the lowest part of the orbit is still going to be at this altitude. And Sile, you were, I think it was you that was asking about stage, how, the, how do they get rid of the stage? Well, that's how they get rid of the stage. They shoot this into an eccentric orbit. It's this white line right here, as opposed to the blue, right? The white line is where they want to be. The blue line is where they are. That's, if they just went around, that's where they would end up. But they're going to fire the engines, and they're going to shoot it into a slightly eccentric orbit. And then they'll deploy the satellites at Apogee. The satellites will use their onboard thrusters to go and move, you know, into their final orbits. And then the second stage will... They could just leave it there. It'll just decay. It'll come back down. It'll burn up. Ideally, you'd want to do a controlled deorbit burn, so you deorbit it out over the ocean where nobody is. Uh, a lot of spaceflight organizations use the South, the South Pacific, because there's nothing there. It's not even a shipping lane. There's just net. There's just water. Uh, so that's where there's a lot of junk down there. Can you see the second stage in the night sky? Nibirius, you guys, if you're over in Europe, you guys probably won't be able to see it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't still look up. It's just the sun is over there. If the sun was like 90 degrees off, so if it was a little earlier in the afternoon and the daylight line was right here instead of over here, you, sh you should be able to see it because it'll be illuminated by the sun. But this thing doesn't have any lights on it, and in the night sky, it's super dark. Yeah, Jenny, Jenny is back at it. That's good. Good, I'm glad. She's a fighter, man. Dumb question. If there's no oxygen in space, how do they relight the engines in space? There's a huge tank of oxygen that's attached to the vehicle, Flyken. That whole liquid oxygen thing? What do you think that's for? How much of a risk is the Russian weapons to test to Starlink missions? Not much, Snowden. No throttle up. It's something to take note of, dude, but it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, there you go, streamers for scale. What about vehicles that don't use locks? No problem, Snowden. Uh, vehicles that don't use liquid oxygen? What, what, what do you mean? So, a hypergall rocket? Most vehicles use liquid oxygen nowadays. There's one or two that do not. And the ones, the one and twos that don't not, that did not, do, rewind 15 seconds. The, the couple of vehicles that don't use liquid oxygen and kerosene or liquid oxygen and hydrogen or liquid oxygen and methane nowadays are using either monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide or unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine and dinitrogen tetroxide. Uh, the Russians' proton rocket uses these. They use hypergolic propellants. Uh, but there's still oxi there's still an oxidizer component in nitrogen tetroxide. So it's, what is nitrogen tetroxide? NO5? No. That would be pentoxide, wouldn't it? It's some weird chemical. 
I forget the any any chem guys out there. N two O four. There you go. Tetra is four. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. I assume you've already discussed the space up spec. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you give me a short opinion on it? It's just Elon cracking the whip. And now, King, I know people. Have, oh, the workers, the workers. Have, I don't care. It, that's not contextual. Don't don't get confused. It's just him cracking the whip. This is something that SpaceX has been doing for twenty years. It's just we got a glimpse of it this time. Quick question about maximum dynamic pressure: Does the speed max Q? Does the speed max Q happens change with the vehicle type? If so, could you delay max Q by making the rocket pointier? Um. Does the speed of the dynamic pressure change with the vehicle? Yes. Uh -huh. It's all about the shape of the vehicle. The shape of the vehicle determines when your maximum dynamic pressure is. I'm not sure if may may making the nose pointier would fix anything. Because that has a lot more to do with a cross section of the vehicle. It's the surface area of oncoming. So, like, if I'm remembering correctly, it's coefficient of drag and stuff. And that, that really is about oncoming surface area exposed to laminar flow. Pointier is better! Get the point to your rocket. Can we look at that flash again? It's nothing, goalie. It's just... Was it seriously necessary to do that on Thanksgiving, though? That seems really uncalled for, IMO. No, 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 King. No, I'm not doing this. I'm not getting into this conversation with you. No, absolutely not. Yes, it's it, it was good because it's his company. He can run it the way he wants. If you have a problem with that, I don't care. He can do whatever he wants. It's his company. You can run your company the way you want. End of discussion. Don't try to make it that argument. That's what. That's why I've discussed it ad nauseum so many times, because people are getting confused. If you have a problem with the way he runs his company, that's fine. But that has nothing to do with analyzing what the situation, what, what that has to do with the situation. No, don't even try. To, don't, e don't even try. I know what you're doing. Don't do it. Don't do it. I got my eye on you. Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. How's the altitude raising with the speed falling? It's a trade-off like in between potential and kinetic energy. Okay? So the orbit is slightly eccentric. If the orbit was perfectly circular, if it was like a perfect circle, speed wouldn't change. Speed would stay constant. Your kinetic and your potential energy would be equal. An orbit that is eccentric, or slightly eccentric, so egg-shaped, right? Not as egg-shaped as what they're going to do, but it is, it's not exactly, it's, it's, it's close, right? You're going to be swapping potential and kinetic energy. What does that mean? Uh, so if I take this, this neutron rocket, right, and I do this, what happens? I throw it up. It has an upwards force, right? With that upwards force, it has a lot of kinetic energy because I pushed it up. Now, when it hits the peak of its arc, right, up here, that's when its kinetic energy is nothing. Why? Because for a split second, it's not moving. It's just sitting there. Because my upwards force gets counteracted by the force of gravity, right? My upwards acceleration gets counteracted, right? Right? A rocket that's in a, an egg-shaped orbit is doing that. That's why its speed changes. But when it falls back down, it's falling fast enough to just completely miss Earth. So, up, up, up. Think of it like juggling almost. That's why the speed is changing. And once again, the, the balance there is a balance between kinetic and potential energy. Kinetic energy is... That's kinetic energy. <laughs> if something is moving, right? Hey, Hired, what's going on? <laughs> that makes sense, dude? Yeah, and oh, another component of that is that Earth is not a perfect sphere. Earth is like if you took a beach ball right? And you filled it with water and you filled it with sand and you filled it with dirt and then started spinning it around. Eventually the beach ball might do this, right? Earth has a non-uniform gravitational pull. All the contents would get shifted around inside of that beach ball, right? So yeah, it's not a perfect sphere. <laughs> yeah. And throw some rocks in there too. 
Oh no! <laughs> Would a perfectly circular orbit be impossible since it needs since it needs to fall back Earth? Uh, zero eccentricity is very hard to achieve. Even if you even if you put something into a zero zero eccentricity orbit, Earth's non-uniform gravitational pull will eventually perturb it enough to uh, uh, change eccentricity just slightly, though, just slightly. Submerged in lava. Yeah, there you go. Example is not realistic. A beach ball is not flat. <laughs> what if you deflate it? See, Amber, I think that's where people are getting confused. That's where people. Are, that's where people are getting confused. A beach ball can also can be flat, but if you inflate it, it's spherical, bro. Sheep, goddamn sheep. Sheep everywhere. This, 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 that's not how that works. Just, just in case anybody's wondering. Can we please have this? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be near that thing, Swishy. Oh, geez. Here, let's see what space tunes they're playing. So the rocket is coasting right now. We'll, we'll come up on... I don't know why they have Seco 2 listed as the next step on the timeline. It's probably because this will be a slight pulse of the main engine. What's the inclination? Starlink sats are... What is it, guys? 50... It's somewhere above 50 degree inclination. What if it's Tom Brady's beach ball? Cajun, Tom Brady is simply a metaphor for humanity. You know, sometimes it's deflated. Sometimes it's not. We ain't perfect. Okay. Tom's perfect, though. Yeah, yeah, Amber, it's 69 degrees inclined. I, I wish. it's. I think it's 50, 51 or 54, I forget. But also... Tom Brady has too much success. I'm talking about Tom Brady's football apotoxin. The football isn't perfect. If he throws the football and it doesn't go where he intended, it's probably the football's fault. It's not Tom Brady's fault. Guys, stop talking about COVID vaccines in here. Please, for the love of God. Don't we get that enough during the day? Bro, stop it. Stop that immediately. You, get enough to, you guys don't have enough of that during the day? <laughs> Come on, man. If Earth has stronger gravity, is some places than others why certain materials gather in stronger fields on Earth? What? It's like, it read about plate tectonics. What time is the Soyuz launch? So, guys, the Soyuz launch got pushed. Uh, some, some additional mission assurance with the Galileo satellites. The second stage is already circularized, Sile. It's going into a higher eccentric orbit. Nice, or not <laughs> the test driver? Do it, man, yeah. I understand that, Admana, but uh, you know, what I'm trying to do here is keep, you know, at least maintain some, ow. Maintain some semblance of normalcy, okay? Like, I'm pretty sure people watch Twitch for entertainment and they really don't want to be bothered with that right now. It's not that people don't care either, and it's not that I don't care. Don't get confused, okay? <laughs> don't get confused, or I will, I will fire my neutron rocket at you, okay? Discovery, go and throttle up. Sebi, did you see that Neutron has canards? They're hypersonic control surfaces, okay? They are not canards. Shut up, Alex.
The Soyuz launch is pushed due to unavailability of a downrange tracking station, which apparently is a ship of some kind. Interesting. Did you talk to Hi no, no, yes, Hypersonic, yes, yes. He did call them canards. No, he is wrong. Peter Beck called them Kennard. No, Alex, no, they are hypersonic control surfaces. He is, that is incorrect. Peter Beck is wrong. No, you're not changing my mind. He did just saying, keep saying, you'd be saying it wrong. Cause he's wrong. You guys like my neutron rocket model? See, this one doesn't have any canards on it. The Starlinks are at 53.22 degrees. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, more like cantnards or canardint. Communard control surfaces. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, who are you gonna believe? Who are you gonna believe? Some guy that makes rockets, some makes some guy that makes fake rockets badly in a video game, or Peter Beck? God, chat, jeez. Your German is showing. You shut your you shut your mouth. The price is wrong, Bobby. I picked the bad video game guy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Fugazi. Canardians? Canardians? Oh god, not them. I have launched a model rocket health this show. Shut up. I also noticed that two legs on Neutron are longer and wider. Maybe range extension, just like New Glenn? I didn't notice that Swiss Shield, but if that's the case, then yes. Peter Beck ate a hat, all right? That's not normal. That's not normal. What motor type? The good kind. Just like the control surface on the Eurofi. No, those are canards, man. Those are canards. Those are canards. I picked the kiwi, the fruit, not the people. Kiwis are... Kiwis are good. Thanks, really helpful. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> what? I'm having like six different conversations, man. Ow. I gotta stop dropping that thing. And you are normal? No, I never said that. I never said that, laser man, okay? <laughs> your, your boy is not, not, not normal. Emperor, we don't talk about that abomination of God, okay? We don't talk about that. Mistakes were made, okay? F15, active. Yeah, actively bad. That's why they made one and said, ooh, no, never mind. Ah, uh, come on! No! 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 You do not- One does not simply take the perfect Chad tier F-15 and put canards on it, alright? That's lips- th th No, that's terror. I was gonna say lipstick on a pig, but that's not the right analogy, okay? That's like- That's like- Okay, so you know the guys that- That have way too much money, and they take a Ferrari, right? And they put a stupid big wing on the Ferrari. The Ferrari doesn't need that, okay? You put it on there because you think it looks cool. And in reality, it probably hinders performance, okay? Which is exactly what happened with the F-15 active. Boom. Roasted. Destroyed. We all need big wangs. Alright, I'll, I'll agree with that. The Ferrari's ugly with, with or without wings. I said I will not tolerate blasphemy in here, okay? Actually, how much coffee do you drink a day? Uh, this is a big coffee mug, and it's two cups in this thing. Um, so, like, six cups of coffee, because I usually have two. Well, four to six cups, depending, dudes. And you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, that's probably, that's probably the reason why I don't sleep very much. Too much coffee, fee, 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 fee. All the coffee fees. I think coffee is frankly delicious. 
Black coffee is amazing. Just switch to bang energy drinks. I can't do energy drinks, bro. You sure it's not the blow? Edmana, do you think I would be as upset as I got on stream yesterday if we had if we if we had bumps available to us? Not a chance, man. Excessive coffee drinking reduces your risk of prostate cancer. All right, well, I got that going for me, which is nice. Can I get a shout out to my alma mater, Holy Cross, as they try to upset Villanova in football in the playoffs. Hell yeah, man. But Blue is going to win anyway, so I mean, sorry. Go Blue. Look, Remo's from Michigan. I have to like Michigan. And Tom Brady went to Michigan, so it's fine. It's fine. I love bumps. Fist bumps. <laughs> when are you going to go back to Flight Sim? I don't know, Gad. Fellas, I... I, like, your boy hasn't been doing very well over the past couple of weeks. I'm not, I'm in a pretty bad spot, like, uh, up here. And I'm not one to bore you with mental health stuff, right? Like, I usually try to find solutions, but yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not doing too good. I think I'm just being, I'm stretching too thin. I'm trying to do too much, and it's, I'm trying to do too much, trying to stream for like 15 hours a day, and yeah. All I do is end up losing sleep. And that's not a bad thing. Well, the, the, the streaming 15 hours a day thing is a bad. The losing sleep is a bad thing. It's kind of making me a little crazy. That's why I think I got so angry yesterday, dude. I, dude, I was, I'm not, I, I've been putting on a brave face, man. <laughs> putting on a brave face, but you know, problems like that affect me just like everybody else. So I'm gonna try. I'm just gonna try to take it easy for the rest of the week, if you don't mind. Talk to your doctor to get better sleep. I, dude, I go to the doctor once a month, Alex, to monitor my health and because of my thyroid, first of all, and second of all, because I'm I sit around all day. That can't be good for you. So I, I actually, dude, I get like blood tests every month just to be sure. Sorry to hear all that. All I can say is I was exactly where you are now a couple weeks ago. Too much crap getting... Yep. Oh, yeah. Rocky guy. No, I, I'm not going to lie, dude. I had a little bit of a break last night. It was not pretty. I was not, not in a good spot, dude. It sucks. But it happens. Like, you know, the way I look at it, it's just emotions, dude. You know, it's just, it, it happens. You have to deal with that. That's part of being a human. You know? Oh, nice, Tessa. There you go. He's good people. Yeah. My primary factor for quitting energy drinks, I went into the doctor's office and had like a 160 over 100 heart rate. And my doctor said, you're going to die if you keep drinking them. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that was my reason for stopping Red Bull. I stopped Red Bull cold turkey and I switched to coffee. We must deal with it. Life goes in cycles. Take care of yourself the best you can. Yeah, Frango. I'm sorry I brought this out on stream. I just missed our flights together. I got you, Gad. Hey, yeah, no worries, dude. No worries. It's all good. I owe you guys I, I owe you guys an explanation for being a piece of crap yesterday. I was a piece of crap to Jim, and I was a piece of crap to you guys yesterday. After you gave me, like, 100 subs. Uh, you guys don't deserve that. You know? I, I owe you an explanation at the least. Yeah. I'm finally only human after all. But on the other hand, the flip side of that is that I want to get, you know, I want to evolve the human condition. No, I, I want to do good work. And uh, yeah, I didn't do good work yesterday in Kerbal. I was very, I was very upset about that. And I got slapped in Hearts of Iron. And I, the worst part about it is, is that I don't understand why I got my tail pushed in yesterday in Hearts of Iron, and then my payload malfunctioned in Kerbal, and then that NSC meeting was a freaking, frankly, a train wreck. Uh, yeah, no, not a lot of things went good yesterday, man, but you guys did gift a lot of subs, and I do appreciate that.
Yeah, there you go, laser man. Bruh. Can we just cart early hours out for a while? I don't know. I'm not sure, Sirius. I think it has a it has more to do with me just playing the games that I want. Part of the reason why I'm stressing myself out is because I'm trying to play Satisfactory and I'm trying to play Hearts of Iron and I'm trying to do stuff in KSP and I'm trying to, you know, I got I'm trying to be better at racing, right? And then I'm, now I for whatever reason I thought I'd pick up chess for for whatever reason. Like I got to I have a lot of unfinished stuff that I want to get done. Yeah, I'm probably going to play some Satisfactory after this, guys. I I just got to kind of take it slow today. Maybe it's time to do a yoga stream? Yeah. I don't I don't want to show myself stretching on stream. Is that is that weird? Just play Star Citizen? FYI, they launched the beta for Icarus. Cool. I don't need to show myself stretching. Goofball, something about that just makes me feel very uncomfortable. I don't know why. <laughs> you know, a cooking stream then? I don't know, dude. I just... Guys, I gotta take it slow a little bit. I'm gonna probably just take it slow a little bit for the rest of the year. And now, what What does that mean? Don't know. Discovery, go at throttle up. Exactly one year ago, I went to the ER after I couldn't carry a propane tank 10 feet. Uh, three rounds of chemo, bone marrow transplant in April. My blood type changed from O plus to A plus last week. Here I still am. Still got a shot to see the moon and Mars landings. Well, Gabe, you know what? That's God damn, man. <laughs> wow, my problems seem very insignificant compared to that. You know, that's, uh, jeez, dude. I'm, a, I'm super happy you're still here, dude. Yep. Wow. What were my problems again? Holy crap. Gabe, as screwed up as that is, that actually made me kind of feel better. But... Are my problems really that bad? Am I re Oh god, EJ has a problem. Can't figure out what video game to play. Huh. Hmm. Either way, I'm happy you're here, man. Well, I think, uh... I think you won, dude. No one guarantees tomorrow, so enjoy it. Well said, man. Well said. Ooh, some artifacting on the camera there. You see that? Last puzz. We already make fun of you. Yoga just gives us more memes. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't need that. But yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it slow. Your blood type can train, change. Cancer does some messed up stuff to people. Gore-Tex. <sighs> Gagan, you got your first coal plant set up in Satisfactory last night. So nice to not have to babysit my power grid anymore. Yep, yep. MSC is on hold till next week. Um, yeah. Once again, I don't know what constitutes taking it slow. I'm just going to kind of play it by ear. And if that means me streaming a game that you don't like, I'm sorry, dudes. Just trust me. I got to... Streaming is stressing me out. And once again, there are people with way worse problems than me. And I understand that. It... it Dude, I've been burning the candle at both ends basically since the start of 2020. Like, and once again, I'm not, this isn't the oppression Olympics, you know what I mean? There are people that have it worse than me and I understand that. What I'm gonna, what I'm trying to tell you is that me taking it slow is gonna help me fix things. What the hell is that? Oh, it's just outgassing. Okay, cool. The, all those little specks of debris that you're seeing flying around, no, they're not UFOs. The second stage, you could see it pulsing every once in a while. It has attitude control thrusters that use cold gas, nitrogen. And when the gas, when they outgas it and the gas goes from really high pressure to extremely low pressure, i.e. the vacuum really quick, it crystallizes. Yeah, Zonku, true that, true that, true that. Yeah, no, what I'm trying to tell you is that me taking it slow is going to fix it. So I can get back to doing all the games that I want to to play with you guys, you know? No, no, it's aliens. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So we're waiting for uh, engine deployment, or not engine deployment, did you see the pulsing right there? Right before they cut the camera? That's what I'm talking about. Do the crystallizing clumps are fine bits? Actually, a lot of different fine bits, see fracking, yeah. It's definitely aliens. Um. 
Uh, pilot Elite, I lost my grandfather on the 6 of April. And then four months later, I lost my grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. What am I meant to do? Yeah, Pilot, yeah. It, you just... It sucks, man. You just gotta find your way. And that's... I know that's easier said than done. It's tough, dude. It's tough. Evil bit, what did you say? Oh, I, I saw you say something. Let's see. It's all about perspective. Problems are no less significant. Yeah, yeah, true that, true that, true that. Yeah, you, yeah, I know, evil bit, yeah. Caffeine is a miracle. Mer mer coffee is a miracle, miracle drug, man. No problem, three soul, I got you. Quick question. What wrench for the main bearings on the crank in MSC? 10 mil? I don't know. I don't know, brother. I'm sorry. I wish I was smart enough to be able to know that off the top of my head. Yeah, Galactic, that's the thing. That's what I mean about it. they're just emotions. It happens, guys. Yep, yeah, see, there's some solid nitrogen over there. It's just emotions, dudes. Everybody has them. And I'm. it does... It does seem like it's tough. It does seem like the whole world's freaking against you and the, it dog piles it on. It happens to me, it happens to everybody. But yeah, Galactic, I understand, I get it. Uh, I'll be fine, I I'll be all right. <laughs> I've dealt with much more stressful situations than this, but this one was pretty bad, dude. I let a lot of stuff boil to a head in one day and I, yeah, that's why I went like, from like zero to no chill yesterday. And I'm like, I'm going to bed, bye. And then I tried to sleep and it didn't work. It's great. Good. That's life, dude. I did a week of school on Zoom because I was having constant headaches from all the students. And now I'm feeling much better and ready for another week. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Bryce, there you go. Oh, see, they're out gassing again. What they're what they're doing is is getting the stage aligned to prograde velocity because it does kind of just. They're they're basically steering it into position with the small thrusters. The thrusters are at the back. They're at the bottom of the second stage and they're gonna rotate the payload. Payload's up here and the second stage is here. They're gonna rotate it into position. I wish XPZ, that'd be, that'd be real nice. But then again, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be human. You know, you remove your emotions, you're not just removing the bad stuff, you're removing the good stuff too. And it sucks because the good stuff is really cool. I like the good stuff. The bad stuff sucks. You know, if we could be selective about it, that would be great. But we're human. That's not going to happen. No, seriously, you're burning out and you need a few days off. It's not that, Swishio. It's not that. It's not that I don't want to stream. Not that. It's not. No, that's not what's going on. It's just stress from doing too much. That's all. I, dude, I don't burn out. <laughs> like... And I know everybody's gonna be like, yeah, okay, EJ. No, I don't, I don't burn out on things. I just stretch myself too thin and that waters down the content and that waters down what I'm doing. And, you know, I find that if you just kind of reel it back in, you don't burn out. Corzy gifted 10 subs. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, that's right, Bram. I'm not going hiking right now, TJ. It's too cold. But anyway, of course, thank you, buddy. Very dumb question. Is it Earth? If so, where exactly? The Pacific? Oh, no, not a dumb question at all. This is south of, uh, of like, so Vietnam is right there. Laos and Cambodia are right there. Uh, this is the coast of Australia, west coast of Australia right here. So it, it's out of the Indian Ocean. That's Madagascar. There's the southern coast of India right there. Of course, he, against the, can't think enough, 10 subs, though. 
appreciate it. So like Perth is over here. Singapore is over there. Expected loss of signal, Diego Garcia. They just uh, reported loss of signal through Diego Garcia, which is the tracking, SpaceX has a tracking station out in the Indian Ocean. No, it's not PBS Dunfield, it's uh, Test Shot Starfish. You can take it, DJ, damn. I'm literally sitting here watching North along the coast and missed it. What's wrong with you? Oops. Thanks. First time watching a space stream. Hey, no problem. Struzakul, you can ask me. I'll try my best to answer. The whole purpose of the stream, it's a STEM stream. I, I show people how cool this stuff is. So if you have questions, just ask. What precisely kind of information do you want from the satellite? Curious, do you think NASA will go back to nuclear thermal engines or to that extent space companies? They already are. It's just they're doing it quietly in the background because people hear nuclear and go, ah! You know. Alright, Sun Temple, see ya. Andy should be coming back here in a Go second. Hey, up. Gold Falcon, he gift, gifted us up to Strezelku. So what is the goal? This rocket blasted off, or lifted off from Florida uh, about about an hour ago. Uh, this is a SpaceX launch, and they're launching their internet satellite, communi internet communication satellites. Will, they're going to do one more burn of the, the second stage here to put it into... Uh, I said before that the white orbit is where they are. The blue orbit is where they need to go. The blue orb, the blue orbit is projected. White is where it is. So they want to, they want to, they're going to do a burn to the stage to put it into this orbit right here. Uh, you'll see that coming up in a second, and then they'll deploy one satellite, and then they'll deploy the rest. You'll, you'll see it here real quick. Yeah, coming up on that here in about less than five minutes. Pretty much, Braz, yeah. Such a pain in the butt, dude. Everybody knows everything about nuclear, but nobody knows anything about nuclear. You know what I mean? You know, people hear nuclear and they think bomb, not entirely understanding that, you know, what neutron flux is and how it can be regulated to a point where, you know, you could say that what a nuclear power plant does and what a nuclear bomb does are two way different things. <laughs> Neutron flux is what causes, um, is what makes nuclear do nuclear things. So basically you're splitting atoms by, by taking the neutrons out of the atoms. Radioactive materials do that naturally. And that's what radioactive decay is. And how long that radioactive decay lasts last four is called half-life can we appreciate how standard and boring the launches and landings have become i yeah it's pretty awesome oh my god nuclear is a dentist yeah right is that a dentist yeah we're crazy right iron is the end of the line indeed and how the rate at which you split the atom is the difference between what a nuke does like an explosion and what the power plant does what I like to tell people is that a nuclear bomb, in terms of neutron flux, is like a camera flash bulb. So, it's a lot of energy that happens all at once. A nuclear power plant is like a light in your house. You just flip it on and it just stays on. That's it. That's the difference. <laughs> the capacitor uses a lot of energy, or a flash bulb uses a lot of energy all at once. The light uses a, not a lot of energy over a very long period of time. Like that one game, Half Life? Something like that. It's fission powered, Entropy. They're not, they're not splitting atoms. Our solar system, the sun fuses atoms. It, its gravitational pull gets, is so ridiculously high that atoms actually fuse with each other and that's why that's why the sun is really bright because it's a huge power plant until the bulb goes out like i said every nuclear material has a half-life you can make it get to that half-life a lot quicker or over a long period of time that's the difference <laughs>
And once again, that's very basic nuclear physics. I'm not an expert on that by any means, but that's the gist of it. Yeah, side gel, it's pretty crazy. I have become death destroyer of worlds. Yeah, yeah, Groin. When he realized what they made, he was like, oh. See last. What's up, Ewok? I mean, Bevita question. How many Starlinks affects watching other celestial bodies? It's not as bad as you might think. SpaceX is basically painting the satellites black so you can't see them, Strezzelku. They're up there, and they will they will get in front of the camera in, a, in some way, shape, or form, but, you know, SpaceX has been trying to make sure that that doesn't happen as much. Ewok, I'm looking for your last. I don't see it. Nice, Bryce. There you go. All right. We should be coming up on... Uh, edge of cutoff. I'm making a naval wargaming tabletop game. Ideas on, wa ideas on what to call it. Uh, battleship. No, wait, no. That's been done already. Um... The map's one giant circle, Flykin. You can use Lape. Take the dirt road through Lape. Um, battle stations. How about call it a head flank, which is the the Navy equivalent of punch it, Chewie. All engines, a head flank. <laughs> Quit making such quality content, you jerk. Okay. No, wait. You're welcome. Predominant, look. Oh, look. So cool, I'm amazed by that. Yeah, no problem, Strasil. That's what we do here, man. You've been there? Nice. Forklift. So, look, Predominant, let me see. Let me see if I got it right. So, Perth. Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Canberra, but nobody, nobody talks about that. And what's on? Canberra doesn't exist. Hobart is down here. Yeah. And Darwin isn't Darwin up there? Is there currently any difference between satisfactory, experimental, and release? No, not right now, Miff. No, there is not. More like can't bear it. Got him. And then there's Bendigo, but nobody talks about Bendigo. Where's Bathurst? Uh, Bathurst is up here somewhere. Further north chaos? Yeah, Darwin's like way up there. Yes, nailed it. There we go. Gotta go to Bendigo, Morty. Gotta go to Bendigo to get me cube, mate. I can think of one reason to like Canberra. Parliament has grass on it so you can walk over all the politicians. I'd prefer because it has a deep space network tracking station there. I don't really need the other reasons. That's right, Spraz. Yeah, we, we're, we're, a bunch, we're a bunch of race car fans in here. We like rockets because they go fast, and we also like race cars because they go fast. Yeah, I th I you can reduce the entire element of this stream is uh, to we we like things that go fast. That's fast. Yeah. My race car doesn't go fast. Yeah, because you like racing forklifts, you weirdo. Can you point to Woomera? Woomera is right here. 
Satisfactory produces things fast. Yep. Bathurst 12 in February. Uh, yeah, I'm ready, dude. But cranes don't go fast. Yeah, but cranes lift things. Heavy things. Those are cool. Cranes are cool. Cranes are the exception. Okay. Welcome back. Hey, if Andy. Joining us, if you're just joining us, a quick recap of today's okay. mission. We had successful Acquisition liftoff of from Tasmania. Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 6 to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. We then had successful stage separation, recovered our first stage after its ninth flight on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, right, and had a successful oh, second wow. stage MVAC engine burn. We are now waiting on the second relight of the second stage, uh, Merlin vacuum engine, and this burn should last just a few seconds. Okay, they're gonna pulse the engine to put it into that eccentric orbit that I was telling you about. You'll see, when they pulse it, you'll see the white line line up with the blue line. Okay. Got a little bit of a fragmented signal here. There we go. And back ignition. Okay. Deco 2. So we just saw uh, that very, very short clip two. there. Um, the Merlin vacuum engine on the second mm. stage ignited for a few seconds. Then we also got confirmation of a good uh, second engine cutoff. Rocket guy, I don't mean to call you out. Are you here, buddy? So we are waiting on confirmation of a good orbit on the second stage. We are out of orbit, sorry. NOI from the flight controllers there, so that's good. I'm noticing some very interesting oscillations, especially during that relight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and guess it's their they they throttled they, they deep throttled that engine for that precise insertion, but uh, yeah, those resonant vibrations didn't go away even after the engine shut off. For this particular mission, we have two rideshare payloads in addition to the Starlink satellite stack. The rideshare payloads are deployed the while the stage is not spinning. Uh, here they are on screen. Uh, well, by contrast, really, the Starlink really stack the satellites is are always deployed while spinning. Uh, the uh, will actually spin at a rate at about three degrees per second. Uh, this creates a small difference in velocity between the individual Starlink satellites, allowing them How to separate over time. How hard is it on an engine when working like that? So again, we are about two and a half minutes away from the first Not Black Sky satellite from deploying. Uh, de from deploying, again, we do have two of them on on board today, and they will be deploying about three minutes apart from one another. So, you, it's going to be tough to see the Black Sky and satellites this shot right deploy. here, um, you can start to see the Starlink stacks. Um, some interesting notes the about the Starlink. Each of those satellites are about 500 pounds. Um, it may have been a camera artifact. All right, here, I, I'll show you what I saw. Um, is it not? Minute. Watch the nozzle when the engine fires. And back ignition. Deco 2. See that? So we just saw uh, that very, very short clip there. That could just be from deep throttling guys with an upper stage engine. But look, th look at that. I don't think that's the camera, homies. I, I mean, they called nominal orbital insertion, so whatever it is, it's not that big of a deal. But yeah, that 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 nozzle is, uh, yeah, it didn't. I'm not gonna say it didn't like that because I don't know for sure. It's pro we've seen the nozzles do that before. It's just something to to note. Payloads um, are again are about me. three minutes apart. Black Sky is a global monitoring company that combines. Space assets with advanced AI. That would just be the startup and machine wobbles. learning That's analysis part of the reason to provide for the customers a first to know advantage. Ah, you're right. Yeah, there's but no now, different. As yeah, we wait, okay. we are enjoying some awesome views of the gotcha. second stage um, space and the Earth. So that is not off. Long story short, it's not off nominal behavior. It's it's behavior that's well understood, which is yeah. I mean that mean that in space terms, that means it's nothing. Okay, we, we're not going to really be able to see 
And as we continue to orbit around the oh, Earth, I'm sorry, yes. we're uh, not going to really be able to see it. The satellite is on top on of the these floor, stacks so right here. We'll periodically lose some signals, but um, oh, yeah, you can see that uh, we're, right. we're trying to get see the signals him? back and the video footage back um, as much as possible as we yeah. uh, hopefully can see the Black Sky satellites deploying from the top of the second stage. Stand by for the call for deploy. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it on the purge line. Global 12 payload deploy confirmed. G12 payload deploy. There we go. Y you, they might be able to see so it. Did get audio if you did gonna see it, you're going to see it right, right there. I am looking on right now to see if we can see it visually. Uh, again, the two Black Sky satellites are actually positioned at the top of the stack. And so the the um, objects, if you will, that are closest to the screen, those are the Starlink satellites. So, Good point. Uh, we didn't quite get the visual confirmation of the first satellite. Maybe we'll get the second one. Um, but again, we are about three minutes away from the second deployment of the Black Sky Satellite. Prepare to fast forward. Preparing to fast forward. Fast forwarding, sir. One interesting thing to know as we continue to get this view here is uh, in space and, and maybe without a point of reference, things seem to look very, very stagnant. Um, if you look at the bottom right hand side of the screen, we are actually traveling at 26,000 kilometers an hour uh, around the Earth. And this is really to, um, this is close to orbital velocity. But at those speeds, you can pretty much travel uh, end to end from America in about 10 minutes. So uh, even though it doesn't look like we're moving very, very quickly, the second stage and the satellite are indeed zipping around the Earth. We need Mr. Radar. No, I need Mr. Coffee. I always have my coffee when I fast forward. You know so right that. Now the second stage is actually uh, just a little bit south and east of Australia. It's continuing. To head east. Those are satellites that haven't found. Those, the the chains of satellites are satellites that haven't gotten to their final orbits yet. These Starlink satellites have very, very, very small thrusters. So the 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 thrusters on these things are they less than that, less than like doing that um the 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 reason they the reason why they're not very powerful is because they don't really need to be um they're what they're what are they are what is called station keeping thrusters they're basically just designed to keep the satellite in a fixed position but spacex also uses them to get to their final orbit but it does take a second for them to get there because the thrusters are so low they're not very powerful oh there is that it over there yep there it is there's that first satellite. All right, we should maybe see the second one here in a second. Yeah, there's the first satellite that they deployed. You'll see the second one here momentarily. In fact, never play this part again. Stand by for the call. Global 13, payload deploy confirmed. All right. And that is great news. We've now successfully deployed the two Black Sky satellites on behalf of our no problem, customer dude. space flight. We are wishing them bon voyage to the two Black Sky sats. And it was our pleasure to give you a lift today. With that, we are awaiting the deployment of our 48 Starlink satellites, which is scheduled to occur about 20 minutes from now. At the time of the, the, of the deployment, we won't actually have ground station coverage, but we'll return just before we acquire a signal to the South Texas station uh, about T plus one hour and 32 minutes to get confirmation of that deployment. Nice. We will see you back here in just a few moments. It really is. Red alert. Discovery, go at throttle up.
There you go, Badger. Nice. I bought one of those recently for the winter, too. Do you like to do any stargazing? I live in the city, Procyon. I don't, I, I would like to, but I don't get to do it as much as I'd like. But, they're actually, you know what, dude? There is a stream. There is a streamer buddy of mine named Econ Greg. Greg is an astronomy streamer. If, if you want the stargazing, if you have a stargazing itch and you can't do it like me, watch Greg. Greg's awesome. His stream is literally just a telescope pointed up at the sky and a camera looking through the viewfinder. And then he just moves the telescope around and takes pictures of different things and tells you about them. It's, dude, it's rad. It's a great stream. <laughs> hey, weather guy, what's going on? I was teaching people about humidity a second ago. Falcon 9, when they filled it up on the pad, weather guy, it didn't... Here, actually, I'll show you. It's going to be a second. When they had it out on the pad, there wasn't much condensation coming off of it, even though it was fully fueled. See that? And I was explaining that is because of low humidity. Who is it? Econ Greg. Yeah. Greg's a great streamer. Fun, funny dude. Yep. Teaching people about that. How about the stars when you two are out in Arizona and New Mexico? Amazing. Badger. Amazing. I really like Arizona. I don't know why. Well, it's because it's it's because it's warm and dry. Cars. Yeah, that's probably the reason. But also, I like the American Southwest. It's very pretty. Yeah, Badger, me too. Flagstaff was a very pleasant surprise, dude. It's so pretty up there. If you want to go hiking, that's that's a good place to do it. But yeah, here, let's go back over to live. Yeah, pilot. Greg's Greg's a funny dude. He's savage. It's the funniest thing because he's he's just a savage. He'll he'll make it's like you ever been to the restaurant like Dick Dick's Last Resort? Where the waitresses make fun of you? <laughs> that, that, Greg is like the dick's last resort of stem streams. I love that guy. He's a funny, funny guy. Was that the cape? Yeah, weather guy. Really low humidity for Florida. Yeah, he has Greganomics. That's right. I think the best part of the states is the sign that says now leaving insert state here. I guess. Yeah, he's an yeah, he's an eco he's an economist. Greg's cool, man. Very cool dude. This is test shot starfish, dude. So right now we're a little ways, uh, pretty much due east of New Zealand, right here, going out over the South Pacific. Got awfully quiet in chat for some reason. Just sitting enjoying the tunes, man. Around 52 temp, 48 dew point, around 80% humidity, give or take. Wait, what's RH, weather guy? I don't know what that means. Relative humidity. Um, so, okay, relative to what? Inquisitive mind. Where over the U.S. will this go on its first pass? Uh, pass, uh... This is gonna fly over Mexico. Crap, I forgot to miss the launch. Everything good? Dude, everything was great, Scrub. Yeah. 
It's how close you are to saturation. Oh, uh, okay, okay. We lost Dick's last resort to COVID last year. I didn't need to know that information, Kid Kim. I didn't need to know that. I know it now, but I didn't need to know that. That sucks, man. God, I, I hate I hate, I hate this timeline so much, man. Like, the space stuff is cherry, dude, but everything else, it's just, oh my god. <laughs> RH of 100% means you're in fog or a cloud. Ah, okay. That's okay. Yeah, Dave, there you go. Adam. Ciao, come stai? What's up, man? It's good to see you, dude. How are you? Okay, Guja. Oh, there you go, Vega. Gabe's probably talking about the local one around here in Massachusetts. Couldn't pay rent in Boston, Gabe? Uh, please, tell me more. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's not funny, but I'm laughing. I was lurking around, my man. Hope you're good. I've been a little burned out on video games in general. I guess that's life growing old, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Adam, I'm not doing good. The winter is pissing me off. <laughs> Amongst other things, man. The sun goes down at 4 p.m., dude. I'm just... And if we didn't have daylight savings time, it would be 3 p.m. Yeah, hard no. Winter's barely started. Is it bad if I'm already over it? I'm just like... If I'm over it, man, it's too bad. Maybe, drummer. I don't know. Better rent than San Francisco. Yeah, but only a little bit... A little bit worse. Jim. Boston, Boston's pretty bad, dude. Yeah, monkey for sure. Yeah, there you go, Foz. That's true. Winter is not good, Koza. What's wrong with you? How, da how dare you? How dare you spread that misinformation in my stream? No! <laughs> Yeah, Chris. Winter is best. Dodo! Nine! What? Warum, Dodo? Nine! 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 Just wake up earlier. <laughs> what if I go to bed later? Is that the same thing? I love snow. Why? What was said yesterday on the space conference? Oh, nothing of substance. Don't worry. You didn't miss anything. It was literally a bunch of people saying, hey, look at how good of a job we do. It's just... It's just... It's terrible. It's ter terrible. It made my face hurt, man. Yeah. Yeah, Tess, I hear you. Yeah, there you go, Storm, right? Yes, yeah, Strockstar, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one. That's, that's a good idea. Yeah, Bryce, I hear you. Dodo, do not speak of this blasphemy. Yarg needs to be right from time to time? Are you feeling okay? You sure?
I'll tell you what, that boy ain't right, man. Hey, Allie. What's working in Mr. Launch? Can you give a TLDR? Um, yeah, everything went good. Yes! Oh, gosh. Yeah, that, that yeah, hi, that's kind of cool, but it's only cool for a second, and then, then it gets terrible. Here, uh, yeah, Allie, everything looked good. The launch was fine. Uh... Yeah, it's pretty textbook. They landed the first stage nine times on that first stage. It's now flown six Starlink missions, Transporter 2, Turksat 5A, and GPS-3 SVO-3. Yeah, nine times on that booster. Play the video at super high speed for TLDR. It really, really awesome plume illumination there. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? Wait, did everything go good? Yeah, Debok, everything is fine, dude. Can I just... Oh, that's so pretty. It looks like a flower. There's engine cutoff. Stand by for staging. And then upper stage ignition. And... Can't wait for the orbital launch. For Starship, dude? Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Oh, dude, look at the heating. That's really cool. Hang on. The exposure changed on the camera, guys. Watch. Watch the colors on the nozzle. Here, watch the nozzle. The exposure changed. So look at it, it's it's white hot, and then the, the exposure will click and it'll change colors, right? See, did you see it? <laughs> Neat. <laughs> they the camera switched the exposure. That's cool. Toasty here. I'm gonna go back up to live here. We're Ali. It's in a coast right now. They deployed the two Black Sky satellites, GS12 and GS13. Uh, those are floating around somewhere up there. We don't have an acquisition of signal because we're out over the South Pacific. There's no there's no ground stations out there. They will have acquisition of signal right after Starlink deployment. Uh, from Starbase, actually. There, you're going to use the Starbase tracking station. Yeah, there you go, Kamir. That too. Boca is ready to track the second stage. Yeah, we can... Here, check this out, guys. So, the tracking station, we actually have a live view, a live view of it because of the Starbase cams. The tracking station, this is from NASA Spaceflight live shot, right? The tracking station, see one of the dishes... It's actually pointed on the horizon. Guess where that dish is pointed? It's pointed at the satellite and the second stage, but that the second stage of satellite are down here. It's going to come up over the horizon, and when we, if you watch NASA Space Flight's live cam of Starbase, you'll see that that dish will go whoop, as the satellite passes over. These dishes are basically on a, a gimbal. They're they're on a basically a big U joint that can pivot in any direction. Yeah, see? That's the that's the ground tracking station. That is the SpaceX South Texas tracking station. You'll hear them call acquisition a signal through it here in a moment. It's going to take a second though. When the satellite gets to like over here or when the payload gets to over here, you'll you'll hear them call it. ETA to deploy. My mom is watching and asked how long until deployment. Um a uh, little bit under 10 minutes, grab. 1.32 is deploy time. Do they have any plans to put more of those dishes around to increase the tracking coverage? I don't think there's much more plans, Sile. They're all over the place. They have them all over the world. Um, there's one in Cornwall in the UK. There's another one in Diego Garcia. There's, uh, there's one in South America. I forget where it is. Uh, there's there's one in New Hampshire. SpaceX has a tracking station in New Hampshire. They also have a tracking station in Texas. You just saw it. 
Um, some tracking stations are bigger than others. Yeah, Gun Hilly. No problem, Marcel. I got you. I don't... Sile, I'm pretty dang sure eventually they're going to switch to Starlink. Starlink will be able to track the stuff for them just fine. Don't forget Bathurst is this weekend. Yeah, Ali, this thing flew past Bath Bathurst, dude. Yeah, we were watching it when it flew past. Well, not past Bathurst. It was more towards Tasmania, but... Little little ways away, but you get the idea. Whoa! That's 10 subs from Marcel. Thank you very much. Discovery. Most of them are automated, Vinius, yeah. Tracking stations haven't been manned in a really long time. The Deep Space Network, though, those ones have people at them. They're not Discovery. automatic. No but the people there aren't they aren't controlling the dish. The dish gets controlled by NASA, or uh, the Europeans can use the DSN as well. Um, Discovery. No Marcel gifted 10 subs. Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate it. Worldwide, they use third-party companies that sell satellite tracking services. Oh, cool, came here. Discovery, go and throttle up. The DSNs have people at them, but that's people to make sure that the dishes aren't messed up. Uh, those, see these, see Discovery, these, see those antennas? Those antennas are tiny compared to some of the 70-meter arrays from the DSN. These dishes are gigantic. Like I said, 70 meter array. It's about 150 feet wide. Look at look at it. There's the big 70. One of the big 70 meter arrays. Look at the people. The dish is freaking huge, dude. That's when they were putting it together. It is very very big. Golden eye. It is a duplicate of Sevenaya. Sevenaya in Goldeneye was a ground tracking station. But, guys, okay, so look at the doorway. See the door on the side of the dish? That should give you your scale for a person. That thing is freaking gigantic, dude. Imagine having that but full of cereal. I, the, uh, I mean, okay. How fast does the gimbal need to move to keep tracking? Uh, not very fast. Not very fast. Uh, that's using a parabolic antenna, so it's kind of a... a par oh, new astronauts. Good tunes. Parabolic antenna is kind of a shotgun blast of radio antenna. <laughs> to be honest, it really depends. So that... Okay, so how a parabolic antenna works is... Uh, the... The signal, the shape of the signal that comes from the antenna sile is kind of a cone. And that cone has a convergence point. The convergence point depends on the diameter of the dish. Uh, no, no, I had that backwards. It goes out, not in. Um, I'm thinking of something different. It goes out, so it's kind of like I said, like a shotgun blast. So they don't, it doesn't need to be pointed like exactly at it. It can be pointed kind of near it and go with it and that's fine. Turn it up, new astronauts. Yeah, exactly, motor. It's gonna have variable speed. All right, well, I'm off to bed. Have fun. Good night. Also, nice to-do list, drummer. I saw it, I just didn't say anything. Oh, there. Huh. Jim, there's, uh tracking stations all over the place, but yeah, I, 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 I'm picking up what you're laying down, buddy. I mean, Don, I'm not going to say that I don't want a Deep Space Network antenna full of cereal. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I'd prefer pudding. i prefer pudding. I tell you, NASA's deep space network is not a feather in our cap. It is, it is pudding in our cap. All right, we don't put feathers in our cap. We put pudding in there. Like the proof is in the pudding. So you take the pudding, you put it in the cap, and then you put it on your head. 
Yeah. Pudding now with extra proof. Are, Jordis, are you talking about taking jello shots or? I mean. Pudding has become my new favorite dessert. <laughs> EJ Pudding SA. <laughs> nice. What's my favorite pudding, you ask? Apollo 8. Remember Apollo 8? That was very inspiring. Discovery. The hat Drop. full of custard. They should be calling for an acquisition of signal here. 100 proof pudding. I still like Diet Mountain Dew. Me too, man. I'm sorry. I love New Astronauts. That's my favorite test shot song. The drop on this song is fantastic. Ready? Do it, C22. You won't. Not really. <laughs> kind of putting on a brave face, but I'll, I'll be alright. Okay. I just gotta take it slow. Go oh, ahead, finger guns. Kind of, Tessa. Thomas, is the tracking array working? Because that South Texas. The South Texas station should be in range now. Feel better, dang it. I'm trying, man. Energy or motivation? Stress, of course. Stress. Maybe, Storm. You got any shine? You tried it bending your knees? Oh, he's trying! Gun fingers if you're a reliever. Okay, they got the call for Starlink separation, dudes. Acquisition of signal, South Texas. AOS South Welcome Texas, baby, there prime. we go. Uh, if you're just joining us, we had a successful liftoff at 6, 12 <laughs> p.m. Eastern time. We saw a successful stage separation. We saw second engine start and second engine cut off successfully twice on the second stage. We were also able to land our first stage booster for the ninth time on our signal, drone yeah. ship a shortfall of Gravitas, and then about 20 minutes ago, we successfully deployed the two Black She's Sky spinning. satellites. That's good, that's, that's, uh, we that's what they want. We were expecting the Starlink satellites to deploy around the T-plus oh, hour oh. in the 29 oh. mark, and at that time, we didn't have ground station coverage, so right now, we should be coming um, in the range of South that Texas ground every station, time. Um, and uh, getting confirmation you of the Starlink satellites. Did you see that? That's so deploy. much. <laughs> I'm hearing satellites that we did indeed get right. <laughs> confirmation of those 48 oh, Starlink God, satellites what a deploying. <laughs> uh, that is the 34th launch of Starlink to date, which means that we've launched nearly 2,000 Starlink satellites thus far. With that said, all, right. all the payloads on today's <laughs> mission uh, on today's mission have reached their intended orbit. Oh my uh, For goodness. now, we will be bringing no, our webcast to an end. Uh, would like to thank the Range and Federal Aviation Administration for supporting today's mission makes me laugh. and to our customer spaceflight. And of course, thank you to all of our viewers oh and God. all of our Starlink customers using our service at this time. <laughs> if you are interested in signing up for Starlink service, head over to Starlink.com. Oh thank you again for watching, and we will see you next time. Six, that was 62 pickup. No, it was that was 48 Starlink satellites. Did you see it? It was like a freaking deck of cards. I'm telling you, they. How they deploy those things, they just... It's 52 pickup. That's it. They have the...
the Starlink satellites are all clamped, right? And then they spin the second stage, and then they just let the clamps go, and the <laughs> Starlink satellites go, woo! No, you can't do that. You can't just deploy 48 satellites all at once. Ha 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 ha, tension rod go, brrrr. <laughs> what do you want me to go back and see? They didn't have any footage of the deployment, but yeah, see, there's the row of satellites. Some of them bumped into each other. Yep. Program propagation of error. Indeed. It is like a deck of cards, team man. That's that's right. <laughs> the, Star the Starlink satellites are designed to bounce off of each other. They're armored. They that's why they just deploy it. You know why? Cuz they couldn't come up with a deployment mechanism that fits in the fairing. So they just said, "Why don't we just release them?" Okay. <laughs> It's pretty awesome, man. Look at that line of satellites. That makes me laugh. I don't know why. I don't know why that's funny, but that's pretty funny. They've launched, and you know, Andy said it, dude. They launched. Hey, Rodding, thank you. They've launched two thousand Starlink satellites, man. Hey, Jay, how are you, man? Do they drift apart? Yeah, boo. What I'm about to tell you is not science fiction. It'll sound like I'm making things up, okay? But I'm not. This Each Starlink satellite has little thrusters on it. Little thrusters and reaction wheels, right? So they have SAS on there if you for the Kerbal players, right? The thrusters are Krypton ion thrusters. No, no, this isn't Star Trek. What they do, the thruster is called a Hall Effect thruster. What they do is inside of the thruster, inside of the combustion chamber, they pump krypton gas in. Uh, and then they arc electricity through like a spark plug, basically. And it arcs electricity it's through no, the line. krypton gas. And the, the Hall effect that happens from that electrical arc, basically the ionization of, of, the, of the krypton actually produces thrust. It's called the Hall Effect Thruster. It's very well documented stuff. They've, they've been using those in space for years. SpaceX has those on their Starlink satellites, and the SAS will orient the satellites as that we you know when they get far enough away from each other, and then they'll use the thrusters to position them, and they'll, and they'll automatically enter their inserted orbit, which is really freaking cool. That's really cutting edge stuff, man. Star Trek Krypton to Superman. Come on, yeah, good point. Okay, gifted a sub to Ewok. Rotting, thank you for the host, buddy. Do we know what the life expectancy of the Starlink satellites are? Because they're in a lower orbit, Rob, they need to use a lot more thruster to keep the satellite where it needs to be. Uh, so about five to five to ten years. Ten years on the very maximum. It's almost like Starlink is purposefully designed to make it so you need to launch a lot to maintain it. Hmm. It's a problem with the rocket with rocket launching. A problem that they fa that you know you face from like commercializing space flight in the past is that where's the demand? You want to start a business moving stuff into space? Oh, that's fine. Where's the demand for it? Elon Musk figured out that in like 2014, 2015. He's like, hmm, there's not really a lot of demand here. I'll make the demand. That's fine. And that's what Starlink is. Starlink is SpaceX's revenue streams. Starship and Falcon 9 are just a means. They're just ways to maintain the Starlink network. Starlink brings you profit so you can make Starship and, Fa and Falcon 9 better. And then make, mu make life multi-planetary. At least that's SpaceX's game plan. Look at me. I am the demand now. Pretty much. Make the demand then. It's actually not a bad idea. Grumman got a contract for $3.1 billion for 18 SRBs for SLS. They did, Hellfish. That's a pretty Chad move from Mr. Pudding, if I do say so myself. If he block buys, if he block buys SLS cores, I will stop making fun of Bill immediately. Halifax thrusters are just fluorescent light bulbs with the end cut off. Changed my mind. <laughs> I, you're not wrong, you know. But the pudding, I'll still make pudding jokes, yeah. Math time, how many Starlink satellites can we get to orbit on one fully loaded Falcon Heavy? Believe it or not, payload to orbit is not the constraint, Don. Volume is the constraint. 
you can only fit 60 satellites in a Falcon 9. Falcon 9 can move more than 60 satellites into space at once, but you can only fit 60 inside the fairing. That's another problem with making launch vehicles. Falcon Heavy. Falcon Heavy could have a fairing that's the size of SLS's fairing. Easily. Oh, you could put like a 10 meter fairing on Falcon Heavy and it'd be able to move, I don't know. Well, theoretically, you could move 180 Starlink satellites in one shot, but you ain't fitting 180 Starlink satellites in Falcon Heavy's fairing. See what I mean? I mean, the where I where am where am I getting 180 from? Falcon 9 can move 60. Falcon Heavy is three Falcon 9s, so it can move three times as much payload, which is about about right. It's about right. Close enough. It's very loose math, but that's the the idea. The idea is that those numbers are wrong, right? But the idea is to give you a good picture in your head. Can you promise? To pudding, stop pudding, making fun of pudding, Bill. Nope. I, I will stop making fun of Bill, but I will never stop making fun of pudding. Okay. What do you think the, the origami of the solar panels that are in the pipeline? Oh, I don't know. I like the circular ones, Scooter, to be honest with you. But anyway, that concludes the coverage, dudes. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, here, check this out. There it is. They bought, they bought uh, boosters for nine flights. And I think it's important to understand that that's nine flights plus the boosters that they already have. So that's for Artemis 4, 5, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Dude, if we get a core stage blocked by, I'm serious. I will stop making fun of Bill because that's, that's intent. That's intent to launch. You don't buy a lot of rockets unless you intend to launch a lot of rockets. So that's a good thing. So in five years, Earth will be slow. Will be showered with old Starlink satellites on a daily basis. Uh, Malachi, they'll burn up. They're not designed to re-enter. It's not Kerbal, dude, where stuff makes it down to the ground. Most like 90% of things that don't have a heat shield just burn up in the atmosphere. So you'll see a lot of shooting stars, which is cool. That's kind of neat. That's already happened with iridium satellites. They're called iridium flares. When the iridium satellite constellation started decaying, it did the same thing. So yeah, going to be a lot of shooting stars across the night sky in five years. <laughs> the release dates 10 SRBs for Artemis 4 to Artemis 8 with money for the BOLE for Artemis 9. That's good, man. That Thomas, that's a good thing. I'm that's dude, good. Good. That makes me believe a lot more that Artemis 3 will happen in 2025. That makes me believe that a lot more. Look, you could sit there and you could say we're going to do this. Or you could say you're spending $3 billion to buy the boosters to do that. That speaks volumes right there. And $3.9 billion over the next 10 years is not bad. That's pretty cheap for the boosters. Considering that's total cost involved. If you just did straight math right there, nine flights, so you do 3.1 billion, three, or it's basically 3.2. 3.2 divided by 18 gives you, I don't know, what is that? I, I mean, how, they, those boosters are not expensive at all. Like maybe 20 to 30 million for a booster? That's really good, considering how much power those things have. Iridium flares. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Thank you, thank you for the expert analysis username. Yeah, I, I misspoke. Uh, let's see. Artemis Nine will also be the first SLS Block Two flight. 177 million per booster. That isn't reusable. Uh, Jim, it's not. It's not. It's not a straight cut like that because that 3.19 is total cost involved. Divide that number by like two to get price per unit. Probably, probably even more. Because it's, you know why? It's more expensive to build the factory for the damn boosters than it is to build the damn booster. But that $177 million per booster has the factory costs and the electric bill factored into it, dude. So it's actually cheaper than that. Good. Good. The only, my only criticism here is that they should have bought more. This contract with a value of $3.19 billion definitizes a, a letter contract awarded in June 2020 that authorized Northrop Grumman to order the long lead items and build twin boosters for the next six SLS flights. The period of performance extends through December 31st, 2031. This includes production and operations for boosters for Artemis 
4 through Artemis 8 in design, development, and evaluation of a booster as part of the Booster Obsolescence and Life Extension program for Artemis 9. Good. 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 Very good. Very good. You guys want to think about that? Here, let me put it to you a different way. I've always said we want more SLS launches, right? That contract goes to 2031. That's 10 years from now. You have Artemis 1, 2, and 3 already produced. Those are, those are already paid for. And this is Artemis 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's do the math. Add 3 to that. That's 9 SLS launches uh, in 9 years. That's pretty good. That's, that's at least 1. You could order more. You could do more. This reflects NASA's baseline cost to have at least one SLS launch per year. Don't get me wrong. It needs to be more. It needs. They should have doubled it. It should be double that. It should be $6.4 billion for flights through Artemis 20. You know what I mean? But this is a good start. No, Ewok. I, I'm playing what I want to play. Yeah. I'm, I need to take it slow. Um, I'm going to just kind of take it slow and... Play what I want to play for the rest of this week, dude. I'm stretching myself way too thin. Uh, I'm, I don't want to play KSP today. So, mm -hmm. things are looking up at NASA. It's getting there, Puerto Rico. It's getting there. That's, this is a step in the right direction. It's for 18 SRBs, though. Okay, I'm confused. 18 SRBs, nine missions. What if Mystery Goo was in pudding? What if the Mystery Goo was pudding? Oh. That explains a lot. Would you like to play a game of chess? No. Will James Webb launch on time? On the 22nd, Jack, and yes, I am excited. That's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. How about global thermonuclear war, weather guy? Does MSC make you happy? No. So when you want to do KSP, the Parabolic Universal Dynamic Directional Interstellar Navigation System, a.k.a. put in Zeray, build it. I'm calling it that, caveman. I'm stealing that from you, and I will call my DSM that. And I will build it. So up to Artemis 12. Yeah, yeah Hellfish, yeah, the contract gets a little weird for the BOLE stuff, meaning that this is in place for the first six missions set in stone, but they're not sure what the, you know... Artemis 9, 10, 11, and 12 are going to look like because it's going to fly block 2. Meaning they're going to... Alright. I can't prove it for sure. Here's what I think. They're going to switch to Omega Boosters. Five segment Omega Boosters on SLS block 2. And SLS's throw weight is going to go up by a couple tons. To say the least. That's what that... Ex that's, what, that's why they purchased the boosters out that far. But they don't know what the pricing structure looks like for those booster obsolescence and life extension programs are. So they know that they're going to need them. So that's good. That's a good thing. What's an Omega booster? It, Omega was a Northrop Grumman designed for a, a launch vehicle, um, Kenwa, that used carbon composite versions of space shuttle boosters. So basically a carbon fiber version of this. Yeah, Omega was cool. Those carbon fiber boosters... So these boosters, the ones that are on SLS right now, those are made out of steel. They're heavy. The carbon composite ones are not. They're not nearly as heavy. They're, the, they're half the booster weight. Uh, not taking into account grain. Grain is like 90% of the mass here. The BOLE, so okay, per the release, the new BOLE boosters will replace the current steel cases used from the space shuttle with a stronger composite case and upgraded structures, electronic TVC, and propellant materials. Wow, those things are going to be really good, Thomas. So SLS with a five-segment Omega booster on the side, Hellfish. Dude, the weight savings are insane there. I, I, dude, I want that. Uh, yeah, I, I'll take that. That's fine. Now, don't get me wrong. It still sucks that they're not reusable. Uh, that blows. But, hey, whatever. Economies to scale is what beats this. You want to go into space more? Fly more. Simple as that. Can you build a replica of James Webb for launch day in KSP? Uh, yeah, of course, Ghost One. I'd have to go and study how the thing moves, which is 
a lot, but yeah. Electric TVC, how that brings back memories of suggested SDS upgrades. Can you imagine, Devlin, if they gave the shuttles those carbon composite SRVs? Just time time frames didn't jive. But that would, dude. That would have that would have increased the shuttle's payload mass easily. I'd say 30 tons. Shuttle that that make the shuttle make it so the shuttle could move 30 tons easily. <laughs> yeah, Swishy, right? Theory, Thomas is an AI funded by the space industry for factual promotion. I'd believe that, Rob. No, no, the whole mega vehicle times two. <laughs> I wish. Even crazier performance. Devlin, I'm actually really looking forward to that. My only gripe with this is that that contract should be nine boosters through, like, 2026. <laughs> That's my only gripe. Uh, hey, the dude, from 2025 to 2030, NASA's going to be doing things. At least I hope. Are they cheaper than the current SRVs? Absolutely. So is the Omega vehicle dead or just... Is it dead dead or just dead? We're most likely not going to see one to our left. 52 launches a year, please. Actually, Giza, I don't think we need 52 launches for SLS a year. With a type of with the type of architecture that SLS uses, four launches a year would be fine. Four launches a year is perfect. That's enough to to have a nice sustainable lunar program. And I'll guarantee I'll guarantee you that that's probably NASA's internal targets. Newton kind of looks like the Aggregate Nine. Yeah, I see it. It's almost like Von Braun had it right. Von Braun. 365 launches a year. Don't tempt me with a good time, dude. Yeah, Rob, I I'm pretty good with that. Did someone say SLS for the next 100 years? Lavi, did you see the, the contract? Missions through Artemis 9 with BLE extension for Block 2 on Artemis 9 with, with Omega Boosters. I don't hate that. That's pretty. That was a pretty Chad move by NASA. You know, it, Lavi. All all that we're missing at this point is the EUS and some core stages. If we block. If they block. If Bill pulls the trigger on those, I, I I was telling everybody this, Lavi. If Bill pulls the trigger on the block by for Artemis core stages, I will stop making fun of him immediately. Well, wait. Would a Falcon Heavy have enough? have enough power to carry a shuttle piggyback or would that be overkill not even close Dama. not even close no way dude i don't think you realize how much power those srbs make Twelve thousand kilonewtons from the four segment boosters on the space shuttle Twelve thousand kilonewtons 1.5 million pounds of thrust from each booster sls is up 200,000 pounds of thrust the SLS ones make 14,000 kilonewtons, or one point, I think it's 1.7 million pounds of thrust, which is absurd. That is an absurd amount of energy being expended. I think we need an SLS 100 years banner in Mission Control. Plus add commercial moon resupply, also space... Uh, Ghost one, hey, everything is kind of coming together, dude. I just... You need... I'll say it once, I'll say it again. I'll say it, this is what something that Jim needed to do... Two years ago. You need to block by core stages. 1.21 mega newtons! Great Scott! Bro, we've been we've got boosters from Artemis 9 OMEs to Artemis 14 and beyond. Orion to A14 suggests contracts soon. I hope, Lavi. I hope. It's pretty heavy. Wait, it has nothing to do with it. It's about mass with rockets. God. You think maybe a starship and a and its booster could take a shuttle piggyback? Purely a thought experiment. Tessa if if I was going to just make a launch vehicle out of Starship parts and shuttle parts, you know what I'd do? I'd take a Starship tanker, okay? Starship tanker variant. So the one that's just a big tank, right? I'd take that. I'd piggyback a shuttle onto it and put two boosters on the sides. <laughs> Reusable external tank, baby. <laughs> that's what I'd do. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Take all the best parts of Energia Uragan, right? And the space shuttle and, and Starship and just... Raptors or SSMEs? Uh, the shuttle would need Raptor engines in this particular case. Yeah, 
the shuttle would need the Raptors. Uh, you'd need to have, you'd need to have three sea level Raptor engines on Starship and three atmospheric, uh, or three vacuum Raptors on the shuttle. Hey, don't don't sit here and say that's a bad idea. You would love to see that. Don't lie. Don't lie. Don't lie. How cool would that actually be? Yeah, the Starship would look like this with no vacuum engines. The Starship external tank would look like that. All you need is the landing engines. No gimbal on the Vactors, though. Well, we'd need to change that. We would need to have gimbalable vacuum Raptors. I don't think that's such a tall order considering the complexity of the idea that we just came up with. Uh, you know what? You know what's even better? Just, just put the shuttle on Starship, put that on top of Super Heavy. That way you're fully reusable. You're good. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then you could launch it with the shuttle or without the shuttle. You get all the best. You get all the benefits of Energia, and you get all the benefits of the space shuttle. You know what? Better yet, just take the shuttle off and make the make the Starship a shuttle. Oh wait, that's what he, that's what they're doing. Star Saturn shuttle Starship shuttle Saturn SLS. <clears throat> Replace the RS twenty fives with Raptors, but put the RS twenty five nozzles onto the Raptor. <laughs> Can't tempt me with a good time. Last, what's up, Chaos? Imagine launching uh, a shuttle to build a space station on a rocket the station is launching on. You could do it. You can get away with it. Can you imagine, like, a space shuttle landing and then Starship doing its flip burn, like, right next to it, and the tower catching it, and the shuttle landing on a runway right next to it? Don't tell me you don't want that. Don't tell me you don't want that. So what I'm hearing is the Saturn shuttle from the 70s. Yes but with stainless steel. SpongeBob had it wrong, Devlin. Everything is not chrome in the future. Everything is stainless steel in the future, okay? And we'll, you know what we'll call it? The Starship external tank with the shuttle on top and the super heavy blunt, we're, we're gonna call it SB-129. It makes sense. What is the size difference of the shuttle versus Starship? Ghost one, Starship is the size Starship. So Starship's upper stage. The, the the actual part with the flappy things, okay? Is the size of the shuttle's external tank. Should I finish this pie? Yes. Okay. Couldn't decide if a piece was too big, so I just said yes, so. What kind of pie is it? It's the one your mother made. What kind of pie is it? Chocolate pudding pie. I tell you, chat, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> yeah, Starship is about as big as that orange thing right there. <laughs> oh hell yeah, it's pudding. Ah, <laughs> uh, yep, yeah. That's how. There's a good comparison. Starship is literally that. It's the size of the orange tank, which is just absurd. Can you imagine though? You have your, you know, Starship, you have your little flappy wings up here, and then the flappy wings are folded up so the SRB can fit. That would be one hell of a launch vehicle. That would be a really, really awesome launch vehicle. Discovery, go at throttle up. Hey, defense, one year resub. I appreciate it. But stainless steel contains 11% chrome, so SpongeBob was right. Yep, yeah, Columbia. I miss her. A lot. Yep. But yeah, that's good. We, you know, we got a we had a rocket launch today. We had Neutron, a new fully reusable or partially reusable launch vehicle from Rocket Lab. Uh, I got a model of one right here, Lavi. I don't know if you've seen it. I got a model of one right here. There we go. What? What? You're going to sit here and you're going to tell me that Rocket Lab's new rocket doesn't freaking look like a nuka cola can from Fallout? Look. Look. See? See? It's the same thing! 
Doesn't anyone notice this? Columbia lives in Cowboy Bebop. That's true. And it was made into an SSDO, which is... Yeah, I don't hate that. Tessa, my only thing is, what the heck are those shuttle engines running on? And where's the fuel tank? I mean, they must have, like, some batteries in the payload bay if they're used... I mean, yeah. You're not wrong. I want those... I want those shuttle engines, Tessa. Can we have those? Could the new could Neutron really not have done that without the little canards and some additional type of control? Yeah, it's, it wouldn't fly very well if it didn't have those control surfaces. It's more bullet shaped. It it does look like a five five six cartridge, doesn't it? Or a two twenty three mutter. It does look like it. It's a big two twenty three cartridge. Yeah, see Hellfish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, I was scrolling up because C Kraken told me to see their last. What's next? Huge fins come back to cars. You're saying that like you don't want that. You want me to CAD print canards for that? No, 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 no. The payload bay was empty. Spike got in it. Yeah, that's right. What the heck is that thing running on? I mean, I, don't get me wrong, Tess. I, I mean, it's the future, so. But man. That's one heck of a resto mod, if I do say so myself. Are we talking about the live action show? No, we don't talk about that, Ender. Because of spoilers. Oh, ho, I had you for a second. Did you see the updated Neutron page? Um, yes. Yes, I have. That's cool. That's a really cool. That's really cool, man. Reusable payload fairing. The second stage rides in the payload fairing on this rocket. So, like, the rocket has a payload bay that starts, like, right here. And then the this entire thing is payload bay. And the front just, the, the front opens. The payload bay opens. And then the fairings come back, Moonraker style. And then it can land. And here's the kicker. It's human rated. I know what the next question is. You're going to ask me how it's human rated. Frick if I know, dude. I don't know. how the, Where are you going to put people in this? Make Neutron and KSP. I think we should. Theme song for the Neutron rocket. <laughs> nice. Om nom nom. Jim, it's freaking new. It's it's Moonraker, dude. Seriously. There was a James Bond movie. Where, look. Spectre Bird 1. Right there. Straight up. It, it ate the Gemini capsule. Just like that. This is a this is from Moonraker. This is a Bond movie from the seventies. Oh no, it's you only live twice. It's not Moonraker. Moonraker's the shuttle, excuse me, you're right. See? Look. Yeah, Moonraker is the shuttle. Yeah, the shuttle one's cool. Bames John? More like Bames Bond. Are you having a bonk, Loopy? God. Bames Berber being but Bettis? Alright. How would you do the fairings in KSP? It's a good question, T man. Not the B meme again. Now I remember. That's one of the movies I have seen. Oh, okay. Also, I was specking out a rocket build I'll probably work on in the next year. So a rocket size... Yeah, I saw your post about it, Lavi, because I follow you now. <laughs> yeah, just look at this thread, okay? Look at this thread! Oh, for... No. 
Stop it. Stop, st stop this. Stop this now. I don't know, demon, maybe. Feed me. Feed me, Seymour. Okay. Okay, that, 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 that's enough internet for the day. <laughs> uh, that's, en that's enough internet for the day, guys. Um, you guys mind if we chill down with some satisfactory? You boys just trying to take it slow. Yeah, I know, Marcel, right? <laughs> can we Can we just chill down with some satisfactory, please? Whatever this is, I want to kill it. What? Oh, dude, I hate that so much. That's so ridiculous. What about MSC? Sha, um, I am going to play whatever I feel like for the rest of this week, dudes. I've been... For whatever wh whatever reason, I've been super stressed out the past couple of weeks. And it's boiling through the stream and I'm getting mad at people on stream. That's a no-no. So... I think it comes from me trying to stretch myself too thin. I'm trying to play too much stuff. So, for the rest of this week, I am just going to chill and play whatever the hell I want. You gotta watch it wake up. Stop being stressed. Don't say that. That just stresses me out more. You gotta watch it wake up. Let me see. 